Okay, so I think uh, because I can I don't have the um, power to. Oh, oh, yes. Yeah, I'm I'm muted now. Finally. <laughs> finally, okay, <laughs> it's perfect. Okay, so we're going to start in two minutes. So I'm just I doesn't I don't see Dr. Medley here. Let me see, Lisa. Are you on? Are you on the Zoom somewhere? Maybe she's muted. Um, Lisa, um, Zoom, please chat me. Right in the chat. Hello, sorry, Professor. I cannot uh, find her. And uh, if uh, she start her video, I will find her. Mm -hmm. Dr. Madali, uh, if you're on the Zoom, can you um, just give me a We can find your name here. Yeah, or turn on your video so that we can find you. <laughs> this is such a hide and seek. <laughs> we'll find her. We might we might have to go to the next speaker and just give her enough time to to figure out maybe she has a problem connecting. If Dr. Modaris is okay with that, we just go for the yeah. speaker. Yeah, if, yeah, I'll Wait. start with the introduction. If she doesn't show up till then, we'll go to the second uh, speaker. Then we will get back to her. I'm still checking. Let, let me, yes. how about another two more minutes? Yeah, I think that's fine. You know, we're also in different universities. So also okay. here, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Madarasi, how are you? How are you? Thank Good to you. see you, sir. Yeah. We're just trying to locate Dr. Madali. I think she has a connection problem. So um, if you're okay with that, while we are trying to resolve that, maybe we just um, switch the speaker. If not, um, no, I think if Dr. Modarisi is okay, I think that will be perfect. That will be fine. We will switch the speakers. Or if you wish, no I can give a different lecture and I can give a different one. No. No, no I hope she shows up. Okay. Okay, so I think we're going to start. Uh, it's we've passed five minutes. Okay, so let's start. I hope she comes right then, or if not, we'll switch to speakers. Okay, so good morning, good evening, and welcome to the second day of the International Virtual Congress on Pediatric Sleep Medicine held by Tehran University of Medical Sciences and also Missouri University. We are more than honored to have you with us today. I'm Dr. Maryam Bakhtiari. I'm a third year pediatric resident here in Children's Medical Center, Tehran University as well. And I have the honor to be here with you guys and to host this meeting. This is actually the basic course of the pediatric um, sleep disorder uh, programs that we've prepared. And hopefully with this momentum, we will continue with the advanced course in the near future. So uh, we have a very, uh, four very distinguished, we have invited four very distinguished guests for our lectures today. So uh, they have accepted our invitation to share their experience and expertise with us. First, we're going to have, uh, hopefully we're going to have Dr. Lisa Medley from University of Chicago with the topic of behavioral insomnia in children. Second, we're going to have Dr. Uh, Mahmoud Reza Ashrafi from Tehran University of Medical Sciences with the topic of parasomnia in children. Third, we're going to have Dr. Reza Sherbin uh, Bad, on, uh, also from Tehran University of Medical Sciences with the topic of how to differentiate parasomnia from frontal lobe epilepsy in children. 
And last but not the least, uh, Dr. David Guzal from um, University of Missouri with the topic of excessive daytime sleepiness in children. We are more than honored to have them and we're more than uh, honored actually again to, uh, that you have accepted our invitation. So before starting this session and this lecture, just, just a few points and a few reminders for everyone. The length of this session is going to be around three hours. You can use the chat section below to write down your questions or your insights or whatever you would like to share with us. We will read them and share with our audiences after each lecturer's speech is over. Don't forget, and I can't stress this, stress this point enough, don't forget to rename your ID your Zoom ID to the actual to your actual name because we are going to use that name on your certificate. So use the name that you have uh, you have used on your registration form so that we can check your present your um, your attendance. And after that, we can give and we can provide you with the certificate. There's no need to write down your name or your email in the chat section. Just rename your user ID and use your actual name and uh, family name. And before starting, I would like to thank again everyone for accepting our invitation, our uh, audiences, our dear friends, our dear colleagues, and also the Office of Vice Chancellors for Global Strategies and International Affairs of Tehran University of Medical Sciences for giving us this platform and to, ho to hold this uh, meeting. Okay, so with this introduction, uh, let's start today's uh, session. First, we're going to have Dr. Medley. I don't, I, let me see if she has joined us yet. If not, we're going to start with Dr. Ashavi. So I don't see her in our participants yet. I think, I think she has a connection problem. So if you don't mind, yes. I apologize, Dr. Ashafi, but- uh, no, uh, Yes, that will be fine. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Ashrafi first, and then hopefully we will back to uh, Dr. Medley. So Dr. Ashrafi, we are all ears. Is it good? Thank you. Good morning and good evening to everybody. I'm Dr. Mahmoud Reza Shafi, pediatric neurologist. I'm working in Children's Medical Center, affiliated to Tehran University of Medical Sciences, Pediatric Center of Excellence in Iran. Sleep problems are common disorders of the human, being especially in children and adolescents. Pediatrician and pediatric neurologists have many cases of sleep disorders that must be differentiated from a less common but more challenging diagnosis of sleep-related epilepsy. I apologize from our international colleagues because this lecture designed for beginners of sleep medicine with some video clips. I hope that is will be useful. It's a recorded lecture, lecture please. Yes, Let okay, it. so I will play your lecture now. Just give me a minute. Hello everybody, I'm so happy to have a talk in the first international virtual course on pediatric sleep medicine. It's my great honor to have a lecture with uh, Professor Gozal and Professor Khairandish, two great international scientists in the field of sleep medicine in the world and their expert colleagues from University of Missouri Health. First, my special thanks to Dr. Modalisi Head of Pediatric Pulmonary Department of Children's Medical Center for scheduling this webinar and my invitation. Second, my thanks to Dr. Ekufar, Director of International Relations of Tehran University of Medical Sciences. This is my outline of lecture. I am going to have a brief review of normal sleep phenomena and parasomnia with some video clips from YouTube and other public media. I would like to start with a case presentation. A six years old boy came to medical attention due to nocturnal awakening one hour after sleep onset. He suddenly begins to show signs of panic such as screaming, flailing or kicking. This is usually accompanied by tachycardia, bracing, high bracing, flushing, 
and a face and sweating. Also his eyes is open. He appears to be afraid of someone or something in his bed. He is unresponsive to his parents when they try to awake him or provide for him a comfort. Sometimes he attempts to escape and have a sleepwalking and some hallucinations. Most attacks last 5 to 10 minutes and after the episode he falls back into a deep sleep and have no memory of the event in the next morning. These events may experience every two weeks. We have spent many hours of life in the sleep. Is it a sleep an inactive process? Sleep is the primary activity of the brain during early development. It is estimated that by the age of two years, the average child has spent about 13 months in a sleeping. Between the ages of two and five years, children spend equal amounts of time awake and asleep, and throughout childhood and adolescence, sleep continues to account for about 40% of child's average day. But it seems that sleep is not an inactive process. Sleep is a complex amalgam of physiologic and behavioral process. Sleep is not a simple lack of awareness, but a complex series of distinct sleep phases that contain, consisted of rapid eye movement sleep and non-rapid eye movement sleep or non-REM sleep. Non-REM sleep includes a variably synchronous cortical electroencephalogram including sleep spindles, K complexes, and slow waves associated with low muscle tone and a minimal psychological activity. Non-REM sleep is convenient, conventionally subdivided into four stages, stage one, two, three, and four, or in updated definitions into three stages, N1, N2, and N3, defined along the axis of EEG. The REM sleep EEG is desynchronized, muscles are atonic, and dreaming is typical. REM sleep usually is not divided into stages. Also, for investigational and research purpose, it can be divided into tonic and phasic types. This is the age characteristic of different stages of a sleep from a stage 1, 2, 3, 4 of non-REM sleep and then REM sleep. A shortened definition of non-REM sleep is a relatively inactive yet actively regulating brain in a movable body and the shorter definition of REM sleep therefore is an activated brain in a paralyzed body. In normal patients, nocturnal sleep consists of a fairly stereotype patterns of cycling through the various sleep stages. Patients descend through stage 1, 2, 3, and 4, followed by REM in a cycle lasting about 90 minutes. The cycle then repeats over the night with progressively less time spent in a slow wave sleep, in other words, in non-REM, and more in REM sleep during the sleep time. In a normal young adult, stage one is less than 10% of the recording, stage two about 50%, and a slow wave and REM about 20% each. Infants younger than six months spend 50% of their sleep time in active REM sleep. Conclusion, sleep is not a simple lack of awareness, but a complex series of distinct sleep phases, each of which has the potential for alterations that can be normal sleep phenomena, can represent a sleep disorder, 
or could be confused with epilepsy. I would like to go back to case presented. It was an event occurred during the sleep time. What is the differential diagnosis? As you see in this figure, nocturnal spells and its overlapping states. As you see, we have sleep phenomena, phenomena that occur during a sleep that can be normal or parasomnia. We have seizure or seizure-like and we have psychogenic spells. Differential diagnosis of nocturnal events in children can be a sleep phenomena, can be psychiatric disorder, can be seizures. First, we start with a sleep phenomena that is normal. It should be remembered that some normal phenomena arising from REM or non-REM sleep may be bothersome enough to a patient to seek medical attention. Normal sleep phenomena consisted of non-REM sleep, that is a sleep starts or a hypnic jerk, and REM sleep, normal sleep phenomena, phenomena that is a sleep paralysis and hypnagogic and hypnopompic hallucinations. A sleep start, yeah, hypnic jerks. A sleep start are experienced by many normal person during the transition between wake and sleep. The most type is motor sleep start, but we have sensory, exploding head syndrome, and explosive tinnitus. That is more complex type of sleep start. A sleep start, a sudden jerk of all or part of the body, occasionally awakening the victim from bed. These are so prevalent as to rarely result in neurology consultation and no need for treatment. However, variation on this term can result in neurology consultation, visual, flash of light, fragmentary visual hallucinations, auditory, loud bang, snapping noise, some aesthetic pain, tingling or other. These sensory phenomena can occur without the body jerk. Explosive tinnitus characterized by loud crashing or banging noise occurring during a sleep most likely represents an auditory sleep starts. And at the final, exploding head syndrome is a variant of a sensory sleep start. This syndrome is characterized by abrupt arousal with the sensation of a loud sound like an explosion or a sensation of bursting or fire work.
A slip paralysis likely represents the persistence of REM slip atonia in wakefulness and is extremely common in patients who are not narcoleptic, occurring in more than 33% of the general population. It may be familiar and is more common in the setting of a sleep deprivation and bedding in the supine position. Management is reassurance where, and this is a normal sleep phenomena of REM sleep. Okay, Dr. Becker, disability. This is taking three effectors every day and pro vigil. Uh, December 26, 2005, it's approximately 6.30 in the evening, and she's taking her effectors and everything like she's supposed to. This has been going on for about an hour and a half. She's stuck in a state of sleep paralysis. I've tried everything to get her out of it. I've been moving her arms, moving her legs, giving her something to drink, talking to her. She's stuck in it. Uh, this, this, We need something else. We need Zyram or something. This is your proof. This is what you need to see. You're seeing it. This isn't just today. This is about a two or three time week occurrence minimum. Sometimes it's every day. All right. You can hear her. She's talk, trying to talk. She can't do it very well. She's probably telling me something to say on here. But you can see she's trying to talk with her mouth and face. Hypnagogic and hypnopompic hallucinations. As with a sleep paralysis, such as sleep as onset, and a sleep offset hallucinatory phenomena are quite common in the non-narcoleptic population and they may be combined with a sleep paralysis, often this combination called old hack phenomena. Let's go back to these slides. Differential diagnosis of nocturnal events in children. Another phenomenon that occurred in a sleep is parasomnias. Parasomnia are part of a larger group of sleep disorders that produce nocturnal events. Parasomnia are defined as undesirable physical events or sensory experiences that occur with entry into, during or arousing from a sleep. In other words, something abnormal occurs during a sleep itself or during the times when the client is falling asleep or waking up. The quality, quantity and timing of the sleep are essentially normal. This is the characteristics of parasomnia. It is episodic in nature. Parasomnia is a reflection of CNS immaturity therefore is more common in children than in adults. It occurred in nearly 15% of children. Often have a positive family story and fortunately they generally outgrow with time therefore is more rare in adults. Parasomnias may be categorized conventional, conveniently as primary sleep parasomnia. In other words, the, there is, this is disorders of sleep states per se, and it can be secondary, secondary to other disorders of organs that manifest themselves during sleep. The secondary sleep parasomnias can be classified further by the organ system involved. For example, secondary to central nervous system, such as headache, exploding head syndrome, seizures due to cardiopulmonary problems such as nocturnal angina pectoris, nocturnal asthma, gastrointestinal especially G reflux and miscellaneous and functional disorders such as muscle cramp, pruritus, trichotillomania, night sweat, tongue biting or neck Internal panic attacks. By far the primary sleep parasomnias are the most common. Primary is more common than secondary sleep parasomnia. 
This is the classification of parasomnia. It can be differentiated as non-REM sleep related parasomnia and REM sleep related parasomnia and other parasomnia. We start with non-REM sleep related parasomnia. The most common of uh, this type is disorder of arousal. The disorder of arousal are the most impressive and most common in the non-REM sleep parasomnia. Disorder of arousal are common in children. In this age group, they typically have considered as a normal age-related sleep manifestations. And often there is no need for neurologic consultation. The disorders of arousal have a unique group of sleep disorders that share similar characteristics and have a common underlying pathophysiology. There is often a family history of disorders of arousal. However, this association has recently been questioned. A specific HLA type such as DQB1 appears to confer susceptibility to sleep watching, one type of arousal parasite. The pathophysiology of disorder of sleeps is not very defined. But one theory is about that several physiologic mechanisms have been proposed to help explain the disorders of arousal. But the current theory postulates that they occur as a result of incomplete transition from one sleep state into another. And this Vulnerability for incomplete transition is maximum between non-REM sleep and the awake state. This is the ICSD3 criteria for the diagnosis of disorder of arousal, International Classification of Sleep Disorders criteria. That some of its main criteria will be mentioned in the next slide. The behavioral episodes commonly begin as partial arousal from a stage entry or a stage 3 and 4 of the older classification. Slow wave sleep and typically are brief but can be protracted lasting up to 30 minutes. Other behavioral manifestations may be based on the following additional features during the event in appropriate speech confusion, staring, absence of response to external stimuli, explosive onset, universal amnesia, dreaming mentation, and diminished cognition. Disorders of arousal may be associated with febrile illness, prior sleep deprivation, physical activity, or emotional stress. This is the different types of uh, disorders of arousal, confusional arousals, sleep terror, and sleep walking. First, confusional arousals. Confusional arousals or sleep drunkenness consisted of a brief periods of confusion and disorientation during and after arousal from slow wave sleep. The timing of the episodes is most commonly during the first half of the night. In other words, in the stage of entry in a sleep. Its main characteristics that differentiate this disorder from other sleep disorders are the lack of displacement, out of bed or walking, lack of an acute fear component such as intense screaming or crying, lack of increased autonomic hyperarousal and amnesia for the event of preceding the arousal. Confusion arousals are almost universal among children younger than five years of age and are less common in older childhood. The prevalence in the adult population is lesser, is approximately 4%. Confusional arousals typically last a few minutes, are terminated by reinitiation of sleep. 
treatment is la rarely indicated because in most cases the disorder remits with age and episodes can be prevented or limited by avoidance of facilitating factors especially sleep deprivation or consumption of stimulants such as caffeine. Pharmacologic management often is not necessary because the arousal episodes are self-limiting. But in refractory case, some patients respond to tricyclic antidepressants such as clomipramine, imipramine, and benzodiazepines such as clonazepam. Let's go to sleep terrors or power nocturnus. Are, this is the most dramatic disorder of arousal. Night terror occur approximately 90 minutes into a sleep during a stage 3 or 4 of non-REM sleep. Night terror usually occur in children 3 to 8 years of age. A sleep terror consisted of a sudden arousal from deep sleep, manifested by piercing a scream, accompanied by significant autonomic arousal and behavioral manifestations of intense fear. In addition to the characteristic sudden arousal, plus the piercing a scream, the patient often exhibits signs of intense fear and extreme panic, inconsolability confusion, sympathetic activity, tachycardia, tachypnea, diaphoresis, flushing of the skin, and even midriasis. Prominent motor activity and displacement seen occasionally, such as running, sleepwalking, that may result to injury. And at the last, amnesia for the event in the next morning of the event. This is the figure that show during the slow wave sleep, the patient, the victim, have a sudden arousal, sit up and scream, panic, autonomic discharge, confusion, and disorientation, no response, attempt to awake, increase confusion, and the next day, amnesia for the event. The duration of the event usually is between 30 seconds to a few minutes. Prevalence is approximately 1 to 6 percent among peripubertal children and 1 percent among adults. Males are more commonly affected than females, with a peak incidence between 5 and 7 years. Episodes tend to decrease in frequency and cease during early adolescence. Insomnia is not as unusual as we may think, and it can take many different forms. 
This young man suffers from what are called night terrors. These night terrors can produce disturbed and frightened behavior even under test conditions. More conventional sleepwalkers can easily perform mechanical actions they carry out repetitively every Behavioral and pharmacologic treatment option for the sleep terror treatment often is unnecessary when episodes are rare but is essential when events are frequent, intense, or disruptive to the patient asleep or may can be uh, injurious to the patients. Protection safety measures, we will describe it more in the sleepwalking, maintaining a regular sleep-wake schedule, a scheduled or anticipatory awakening, especially when the time of the sleep terror is same for each event, and that the last pharmacotherapy for severe, frequent, and refractory sleep terror episodes. Low-dose benzodiazepines such as clonazepam and diazepam and tricyclic antidepressants is suitable for these types of sleep terrors. Sleepwalking or somnambulism. Sleepwalking or somnambulism consists of complex behavior that are initiated during a slow wave sleep but result in walking during a sleep. The episodes generally last from one to five minutes and may consist of a wide range of activities. Typical frequency ranges from several times a week to only when precipitating factors are present. Sleepwalking occasionally may result in fall and injuries during the episode. Also the person may be alert after several minutes of awakening. Complete amnesia for the episode is common on the next day. Most behaviors during a sleepwalking are routine and of low level intensity such as sitting up, picking the sheets or walking around the bedroom but can be more complex. Some complicated behaviors may occur also such as urinating in a closet, leaving the house, running, eating, tucking, driving or even committing murder. A real danger is that the individual will be injured by going through a window or falling from a height. The prevalence of sleepwalking in the general pediatric population is between 1 to 17 percent. Most commonly begins between the ages of 4 and 8 and peaking at 11 and 12 years of age and approach 4% in adults whereas about 10 to 30% of children have at least one sleepwalking episode only about 1 to 5% have repeated episodes Doyle. By day, he's a mild-mannered bank executive who lives with his wife in a suburb of Minneapolis. By night, he wanders the house in a deep slumber, acting out his strangest and wildest dreams. Ran down the hallway and jumped from the top step and landed somewhere near the, the bottom. Um, I got back, or I got up and went back to bed, and um, the following morning I didn't realize what I had done until I sat down on a wooden chair in the kitchen. And I thought I was going to die because of how bad it hurt to sit. The cornerstone to managing a sleepwalking and the other disorder of arousal is maximizing patient safety, achieved by avoiding the precipitating factors and ensuring a safe living environment. For example, covering windows, removal of sharp edged furniture, Eliminating obstacles that may lead to injury during a sleepwalking or a sleep terror episode. Locking doors, using door alarms, and providing the safest possible sleeping area on the ground floor rather than upstairs.
A schedule awakening approximately 15 to 30 minutes before the child typically experiences a sleepwalking episode. And definitive pharmacotherapy for frequent and severe episodes with tricyclic antidepressants and benzodiazepines such as clonazepam and diazepam. Let's go to another primary sleep parasomnias in the category of non-REM sleep related parasomnias, sleep related eating disorder. Yeah. The sleep related eating disorder characterized by frequent episodes of nocturnal eating, generally without full conscious awareness, usually not associated with waking eating disorder, likely represent a specialized form of disorder of arousal. This condition of a response to treatment with a combination of dopaminergic and opiate agents or two periods. Eats a bit of her brownie, she extends the pinky of her hand and nibbles on it, and that's no way that she would ever eat during the daytime. This 21-year-old woman eats and drinks continuously over two hours while asleep in the dead of night. She starts munching on bread. A few minutes later, she washes it down. Then it's the bread again, then potato chips, the drink, and once more, the chips. The sleep eaters generally have partial awareness of what they're doing, but they don't know the full extent until the next morning. Then with horror, they will see all that they ate. Here, it was a bite out of a frozen pizza. And also, they really are very disgusted with how they ate, such as spaghetti and meatballs with their bare hands, or they make a... Okay, primary sleep parasomnia in the category of REM sleep related parasomnia. I'm going to have some explanation about REM sleep behavior disorder, or RBD, and nightmare disorder. RBD. RBD is a unique parasomnia characterized by loss of REM sleep atonia and dream enactment behavior. RBD is the most common of the REM parasomnia and is most seen primarily in older men. Majority are over six years. About half of patients have non-neurologic disorders such as Parkinson and dementia. The presence of RBC in younger persons, particularly younger women, should lead to suspicion of medication-induced RBD, post-traumatic stress disorder, or RBD associ associated with structural sinus lesions or narcolepsy. The prevalence of RBD is uncertain. RBD is characterized by agitated, sometimes violent movements occurring during REM sleep, kicking, punching, jumping, and running from the bed are commonly seen. Injuries also common and can occur to either the patient or the bed partner. Acts out his dreams. One patient like him tied himself to the bedpost each night to prevent himself from attacking his wife. Evidence from a 1997 poll of over 4,000 people in Britain found that two in every hundred experienced some form of night violence. What we're doing here is really defining a third area of being. We're saying there's sleep, there's waking, and there's something that is in between that is not dreaming. The goals of RBD treatment are to reduce dream enactment behavior, frequency, and severity and to prevent injury. Bedroom safety principles is very important. Melatonin and clonazepam are the two main essay of RBD pharmacologic treatment and appear to be similarly effective in 90% of patients in reducing dream enactment behavior. Other drugs also have been reported as you see in this slide, some anti-epileptic drugs such as carbamazepine and gabapentin and sonizamid are in this category of drugs. At the last type, nightmare disorder is another rem sleep related parasomnia. 
Nightmares are scary dreams that awaken children and make them afraid to go back to sleep. Patients with nightmare disorder should meet the following criteria. Repeated occurrence of extended, extremely dysphoric and well-remembered dreams that usually involve treats to survival, security or physical integrity, rapidly becoming oriented and alert on awakening, clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational or other important areas of functioning that is caused by the dream experience of the sleep. Nightmare may happen for no known reason but sometimes occur when the child has seen or heard things that upset him or her. These can be things that actually happen or are make belief. Nightmare often relate to developmental stages of a child. For example, toddlers may dream about separation anxiety of parents. Preschoolers may dream about monster of dark. School age children may dream about death or real dangers. Occasional nightmares are frequent in children, 60 to near 75 percent, beginning as young as 2.5 years old and peaking between 6 and 10 years old. Nightmares are repeated more than once a week in only 2 percent to 8 percent of children, but they often persist in adulthood. Years and boys are equally affected until late adolescence when girls are more affected than boys. Half of all adults recall an occasional nightmare, whereas one person report more than an occasional nightmare per week. About 4% of adults suffer from a nightmare disorder. This is the differences between a sleep terror and nightmare. In a sleep terror, timing during the night is in the first third of the sleep because it is a non rem sleep disorder. Movements are common. The episode is severe. Vocalization is common. Autonomic discharge severe and intense. Omnesy for the uh, event is not present. A state of awakening, confused and disoriented. Injury during the episode is common. Violence is common and displacement from the bed is common. But in the nightmare, timing during the night, it occurs in the last third of the sleep. Movement is rare. Severity is mild. Vocalization is rare. Autonomic discharge is mild. Omnesy for the event is present. State of waking, lucid. Injury rare, violence rare, and displacement from the bed is very rare. The best established treatment of idiopathic nightmare disorder is systemic desensitization and progressive deep muscle relaxation training. Treatment with lower grade evidence includes several drugs that may be effective in recurrent nightmares such as cypreptidine, gabapentin, tricyclic antidepressant and behavioral therapies. This is a painting about nightmare in Detroit in Institute of Art. Uh, I would like to describe three types of the miscellaneous primary sleep disorders. Sleep disorders in this category are sleep-related expiratory groaning, aneurysis, rhythmic movement disorder, proprio-spinal myoclonus, somnilaki or sleep tucking, and paroxysm. 
a sleep related expiratory groaning groaning during a sleep has been termed catatrenia catatrenia is another name for sleep related expiratory groaning the groans occur intermittently during either REM or non-REM sleep and are characterized by prolonged often very loud often socially disruptive groaning sounds during expiration in clusters of two minutes to an hour the exact etiology is unknown and no specific therapy has been found to be effective catatrenia often begins in childhood but generally does not come to medical attention until the person plans to sleep in a dormitory environment such as in college or in the military or after the marriage for awakening of the audience there that are asleep rhythmic movement disorder or RMD formerly termed Jack Tatio Capitis Nocturna refers to a group of actions characterized by stereotype movements means rhythmic oscillation of the head limbs head banging head rocking during a sleep seen most commonly in childhood its persistence into adulthood is not uncommon the etiology is unknown and may be familial in some cases RMD can arise from all stages of sleep including REM and it can occur during the transition from wake to sleep significant injury from repetitive pounding can result another video in an adult
rhythm movement disorder or jactatio capitis. Tricycle antidepressants and benzodiazepines, particularly clonazepam, may be effective. And for protection, water bed can improve the rhythmic actions with controlled sleep restriction. Somnilaki or sleep tucking. Somnilaki can occur in non-REM or REM sleep. It is very common, particularly in children. It is a benign event and should be easily distinguished from nocturnal seizures. Unlike seizures, speech during sleep tucking is random but ictal speech tends to be stereotyped in a given individual. With somnilaki, there should be no abnormal movements such as drooling, tongue biting, or incontinence. There is no treatment and it needs no treatment, in other words. Let's come back to the case presented in the beginning of the lecture. It was a slip throw, one type of arousal disorders. At the last are conclusions. Parasomnias are episodic in nature and are a reflection of CNS in maturity. Therefore, they are more common in children than in adults. A detailed history from the patient, especially from the witness of these events, can provide valuable insight and lead to correct diagnosis of parasomnias. Homemade videos recording is available and can be used to lend support the presumptive diagnosis. Non-related parasomnias, which are common in childhood, show a great prognosis. Since severity decreases with age, the symptoms tend to resolve during puberty, but in adults. In adults suffering from non-REM-related parasomnias, however, are faced with a stronger persistence of the symptoms. The major differential diagnosis in patients with parasomnias is sleep-related epilepsy, and differentiating parasomnias from sleep-related epilepsy can be challenging. Thanks 
for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ashafi, for this amazing lecture, actually for the amazing videos. It was really interesting and uh, thank you for that. So let me just check the uh, chat because I couldn't check it before. I just saw a, a point, uh, someone mentioned this point that we should think about obstruct obstructive sleep apnea in background of all of types of uh, repeating parasomnia. So uh, Dr. Ashrafi, do you want to add anything to this or do you agree with this opinion or you disagree with that? Okay, so uh, thank you, Dr. Ashtrafi. So um, I can't hear, uh, I can't, uh, I don't see any other questions in the chat section. So thanks again for this amazing lecture. So we're going to go back to our next lecture. Uh, we had uh, actually our first uh, speaker. I can see her still in our, uh, I, I think she's not, uh, she hasn't joined us yet, uh, Dr. Medley. So uh, Dr. Khairandis has uh, generously accepted to give us another amazing lecture like, his, like her yesterday's lecture. So Dr. Khairandis, if you can hear me, we are sorry, ready sorry to- Sorry to interrupt. Uh, we have Dr. Lisa in the room. Oh, okay, I... so perfect. Oh, so Dr. Medley, hi. Can you hear me? Hi. I'm so sorry, I didn't see you there. I thought you were, you were still absent, so sorry. I apologize for the confusion about the timing. Thank you so much for making okay. it work. And Thank you for joining us. Thank you for <laughs> accepting our invitation. This is such an honor. Thank you guys. I'm so happy to be here and I'm glad this still worked out okay. Thanks for swapping with me this morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, so I can see that you're co-host now. So whenever you're ready, we're ready to listen to this amazing lecture. Okay, wonderful. So I am going to go ahead and share my screen. Let's see here. Make sure. So if is there anything I can help? Um, there we go. Let's see. Should be. Um, I'm just trying to do this. There we go. <laughs> yes, we have it. Okay, fun, wonderful. Okay. So I am so excited to talk to you guys today about behavioral insomnia of childhood. Um, so I'm going to go through and I will, um, I have a lot of slides to cover, but please feel free to hop in and ask questions as I go. Um, I'm going to first talk about diagnosis and then go into prevalent impact assessment and treatment. So the, um, it's interesting because the diagnostic approach for insomnia, we used to have very specific ways that we diagnosed insomnia. And um, in clinic, conceptually, we still use these approaches for diagnosis. Um, so, um, but I'll tell you more about that in just a moment. So the diagnostic approaches that we used to use, and we still kind of use conceptually in clinic, um, the first one's called behavioral insomnia of childhood sleep onset association type. And so um, <laughs> this picture kind of represents it a little bit. It means that a child learns to fall asleep with some conditions present. So typically the conditions present are the parent is holding the child, rocking the child, laying next to the child, and when they wake up in the middle of the night, they're not able to return to sleep unless that same condition is present. So um, the next type of behavioral insomnia of childhood is a limit setting type. These are kids that refuse to go to bed. They are having tantrums at bedtime. They are, as soon as the parent puts them down, they come right back up from bed and they are not following the bedtime rules. And then the combined type is when there are features of both. 
So the, um, because there wasn't such great consistency when people went to, um, when we did iterator reliability studies, they did away with the specific approaches to diagnosing insomnia and more recently, the International Classification of Sleep Disorders, the third edition, um, came out with a more general approach to diagnosing insomnia where you just specify if it's chronic or short term. So really now to diagnose insomnia, you just need to see that the child is having trouble with sleep three or more nights a week for at least three months and that there's some kind of accompanying distress or dysfunction. The teenagers are kind of like a different bag of worms. <laughs> they're a very complex type of uh, sleeper. And um, there are a lot of different types of sleep problems that teenagers can have. So the teenagers can have the same type of insomnia that adults have, which is psychophysiological insomnia, learned or conditioned insomnia. And this is when they start to experience, and this is some adults, somebody, some people that are on this meeting today might experience a little bit of this because a lot of, there's a lot of new onset insomnia with the pandemic. So it's when you start to have a little bit of trouble with sleep and then because of that trouble with sleep, you begin to try harder to sleep. Well, I got to figure this out. Let me figure this out. I got to sleep. And then with that increased effort, that actually creates more insomnia. So in the past, we called this psychophysiological insomnia. That's learned or conditioned insomnia. Now, another way that teenagers display difficulty with falling asleep is a delayed sleep phase disorder. So teenagers have this natural delayed sleep based tendency where their internal clock is set so that they want to go to bed later and sleep in later. But unfortunately, the average high school start time is fairly early. And so it's really just not conducive to their internal clock. And they end up suffering from insomnia and excessive daytime sleepiness in those morning hours. Then there is the chronic volitional sleep restrictions. You can see this image as a teenager gaming at night. Um, the inadequate sleep hygiene. So kids, uh, teenagers can have um, poor sleep habits. And, you know, a lot of teenagers have quite, have a lot of devices in their bedroom. And the, teen, the families that I work with in clinic, the parents have a really hard time um, have it, taking the, the devices out of the bedroom. It's a hard, um, it's a hard battle for them to cross and those devices in the bedroom ends up keeping them up quite a bit. In terms of prevalence, um, sleep problems in children are highly prevalent. So the community survey data shows that there's a, you know, a range of 25 to 50% of kids are struggling with sleep. And so we know that this is a very big problem. Um, so anyone here that's, you know, that's listening to this lecture that has kids um, has probably seen some experiences of sleep difficulties along the way. And sleep problems, um, and this insomnia in particular is, is related to sleep loss. And so with that sleep loss, there are, is quite a bit of impact on uh, daytime mood and function. In terms of mood expression, we tend to see poor frustration tolerance or irritability, kind of that crankiness in kids. Um, if there's underlying anxiety or depression, we see increase or exacerbation of those symptoms. In terms of behavioral problems, kids end up um, expressing hyperactivity, impulsivity, and aggressive behaviors. And uh, we do see there have been a lot of neurocognitive studies showing problems with attention concentration and then specifically processing speeds, so slower to respond to information and response time, how fast they respond to information. There is also a significant impact on school performance, um, social interactions, um, if they're old enough to work, and then if they're driving, and there's impact there as well. In the health domain, um, there are, I work with a lot of kids who have comorbid pain conditions, um, and that is certainly impacted by sleep loss and insomnia. And there's also uh, impact on metabolic function and immune system. Family function is, takes a hit when it comes to insomnia. There's a lot of conflict at night and in the morning when dealing with behavioral insomnia of childhood, especially in the teenager space who are struggling to get up in the morning. So the additional thing to think about is that the, the addition to having family conflict, there's also parent sleep loss. So when kids are losing sleep, parents are losing sleep. And then I also put in their parents' bed, right? So the other big loss, a lot of times the parents are coming in there, we just want our bed back. <laughs> you know, we just would like to have our bed back to ourselves. <laughs> so, I mean, it's like an under-discussed topic, but it's actually very important. The parents lose their bed. 
And so, um, of course, I, you know, I want to make a point to at least bring up the pandemic as well while we're going through behavioral insomnia of childhood. You know, when we're talking about the impact on the immune system, it's really, um, I just wanted to add an extra slide there too, because we know that, you know, sleep loss does impact immune system function. When we're sick, we tend to sleep more, and when we lose sleep, we're more at risk to be sick. So um, yesterday I saw a patient that, you know, was um, had recently contracted COVID, and she was in our uh, sleep program. She was in CBTI, Cognitive Behavioral Treatment for Insomnia. She's like, Jack, I'm so sorry. I've been taking naps, and I haven't been following my sleep schedule because I had COVID. And I was like, that's okay, you know, if they're, um, when you, you know, your body needs to recover and um, you need your immune system fighting at full capacity. And so there are, there is going to be an increased drive for sleep and increased sleep need during that time. But we also want to emphasize the importance of addressing any sleep problems, because if we don't address sleep problems that are occurring, which they're occurring in a much increased uh, fashion right now with the pandemic, if we don't address them, people suffering from sleep loss are going to be at higher risk to contract a virus because their immune system isn't going to be functioning at full capacity. Some other relevant changes that I wanted to discuss in the pediatric space for sleep with regards to COVID. So, Nowadays, there's um, this huge change of having unconstrained sleep schedules. So what I mean by that is there isn't this urgency in the morning. We got to get the kids up and out of school and out of you know the house for school. Um, so that's a significant change. And there's also a significant change with regards to prolonged screen exposure. They're not just using their devices for you know for fun and social you know. The, um, for playing games. They're using devices for socializing and for school. So there is increased time on screens. And then there's also limited access to outdoor activities and peer interactions and elevated stress and anxiety overall. So this recent study coming out, that came out in 2020 showed that um, when, they, when they surveyed families found that they're uh, of preschool children, parents of preschool children, they found that the kids were going to bed later and waking up later. And they were actually, while they had comparable 24 hour sleep duration, they were having longer stretches of time sleeping at night and shorter stretches of nap duration, which was interesting in the, PDF, in the, um, in the preschool sample. And so uh, the, what, was, what was interesting that they also found as potential mediating factors is that behavioral practices, so, what the families were doing in terms of sleeping arrangements and whether they were reducing electronic devices and whether they were keeping a regular diet impacted whether there were sleep problems in the home during the pandemic. As well, parenting practices, so whether there was, you know, a harmonious family atmosphere, which is not so easy to pull off these days, but you know that factor did impact whether there were sleep problems in the home, and then making sure that there was time for parent-child interaction and, and communication. That you know parents were pulling kids away from screens and making time to talk with them also impacted whether there were sleep problems. And I'll get back more to some COVID tips later. Um, I um, wanted to also bring up the. Um, the importance of making sure we understand what a sleepy child looks like. <laughs> when we're adult, adults that are tired, we have low energy, we're fatigued, whereas kids that are tired are hyperactive. And that's important to know because that can that can affect um, that can affect uh, potential diagnosis and the pathway that people that parents and, and schools go down. So um, there is a study where they um, randomized healthy children to either a sleep deprived arm or an optimal sleep arm. And they gave them a battery of tests that are commonly given for diagnosing ADHD. And they found that those were in the sleep deprived arm actually were more likely to display symptoms of ADHD. And these were perfectly normal kiddos that uh, didn't otherwise have any symptoms of ADHD. And so that's really important because that could potentially contribute to a false positive diagnosis of ADHD. In a busy pediatrician clinic where an average visit is only about eight minutes long, we just want to make sure that, you know, sleep is not forgotten in the mix of questions. And so if a parent or a school is noting symptoms of ADHD, 
um, it's really important that sleep is asked about. So we want to make sure that, you know, symptoms of um, any of snoring, of our last restless leg symptoms, insomnia are asked about. And if there are any symptoms displayed, that they're then further evaluated and addressed. So um, if there is no sleep symptom, if there are no sleep, and then after they're addressed, by the way, that's a great point in time to then go reevaluate. Are the ADHD symptoms present? Do we need to do a neuro-psych evaluation? Um, if they're not, um, if there's no sleep symptoms or no sleep disorder diagnosed, then of course, then it makes sense to kind of continue on with the pathway of diagnosing ADHD. But then I also make a point that if there is, um, if there is going to be a stimulant medication pursued, make sure there's education about sleep hygiene and timing of dosing. I'm still seeing kids out there that are taking late doses of stimulants and then presenting to clinic with insomnia. So in terms of assessment for insomnia, we always start off with a clinical interview. So that's the first thing we do. We incorporate subjective measures. We have families fill in sleep blogs or sleep diaries. We, we do sometimes use actigraphy and uh, overall polysomnography overnight sleep study is not indicated. And so it won't even really cover it um, unless there's a medically based sleep disorder suspected. And I should mention the reason is, is because a single night in a sleep lab is not really a representation of what's happening in the insomnia symptom space. So people typically sleep differently in a sleep lab. So, um, and, and it's not, and, and it's better to kind of collect two weeks of data in order to see patterns to fully diagnose insomnia. When we're talking about subjective measures, this is a great scale that can be used. Um, the Pediatric Insomnia Severity Index, um, it's a nice quick scale that um, gets at questions with regards to insomnia and also is, um, and it can be used repeatedly. So you could ask it at the first visit and then ask it at follow-up sessions as well to see if these metrics are improving as you're going through treatment sessions. The sleep logs are the bread and butter of um, what you would do to help a family um, in, in managing the behavioral insomnia of childhood. So families or parents are going to fill in um, a sleep log in the morning, and they're going to just take a two-minute guess to reflect on the night before. And they're, um, and parents are always telling you, well, I don't know, I'm not sure exactly what happens. And it's okay to not know for sure. Um, we just want them to give a quick guess because I always say, you know better than we do, right? So um, when they're filling in this data um, from that information, from the, we, we tell them to put down what time they turn the lights out, how long it took them to fall asleep, the number of wake ups, how long the child was awake total, what time they woke in the morning and got out of bed. From there, they are going to be then filling in the, um, from there, we, we calculate, actually, we have a spreadsheet that does the calculations for us, but if you wanted to do the math on your own, it's, it's very simple math. You just look at first the number of minutes that the child spent in bed, so from bedtime to wake, from, from bedtime to out of bedtime, and then from, the, from that number of minutes, you subtract how long they were awake in bed in the morning, subtract how long they're awake in bed in the middle of the night, and then subtract how long it took them to fall asleep. That's total sleep time number of minutes. Then you divide total sleep time number of minutes by time in bed number of minutes, and that gives you your sleep efficiency. So when we were talking before about doing this pediatric insomnia severity index on a week-to-week -week basis, you could also calculate these sleep log averages on a week-to-week -week basis to see if you're making improvements while you're teaching behavioral strategies. We also use actigraphy, which I always call our spy equipment for the sleepy teens. It's no surprise that when a parent presents with a sleepy teenager that they can't get out of bed in the morning, the teenager insists that they're sleeping at night. They're not going to come in and admit to me and their parents that they're up playing video games all night. Um, so they will tell us, yeah, I'm sleeping, I'm sleeping, but oftentimes this is what the actigraphy, the actigram comes back looking like. Actigraphy, this upper right corner, is what the watch looks like. Um, it's a watch, it's a wrist-worn device that has an accelerometer built in to in, um, calculate sleep versus wake based on movement. 
And from that data, we have we have um, our teenagers or sometimes older children as well. We are the device for two weeks, and once we've collected that data, it will give us an actogram. We score it, and, and then we look at the actogram, and from the, this is what the actogram looks like. So each block is one hour. The blue blocks represent sleep. This green area represents when they're trying for sleep, the insomnia comport, component. And then these black uh, vertical lines, that's movement or activity. And then the yellow squiggly line is light exposure. So um, this is just an example of what a sleepy teen actogram looks like, where they are staying up really late on weeknights. Um, they tend to have a delayed sleep phase, as we talked about before anyway, and then you kind of couple it with having devices in the bedroom and it's just a perfect form for symptoms. And so they are sleep deprived often during the week and then they sleep extend on the weekends. Um, they often take naps right throughout the week as well to kind of make up for the sleep loss. In terms of management for pediatric insomnia, the practice parameters um, released by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine so that behavioral interventions are effective. So they looked at 52 studies and found that those surveyed um, in the 52 studies, 94% reported that behavioral interventions um, significantly reduced bedtime resistance and night wakings. So this is, um, so behavioral interventions are significantly um, are, are shown in the research to be significantly helpful for management of behavioral sleep problems. So um, I'll start off by reviewing some sleep hygiene tips. Um, this is just a cartoon image that shows what we want the bedroom to look like. Um, we don't want all of the devices in there. Uh, we want, uh, we actually don't even want all the toys in there. We only want one bedtime buddy. Uh, we want nice, heavy blackout shades, comfortable bedding, and really to just be the bed, the dresser, and the closet. Another sleep hygiene rule is that we do want all electronics left outside of the bedroom. Um, and actually, we want the parents to remove the devices one hour before bedtime. I always encourage parents to do this one hour before instead of waiting until the last minute to pull the devices away. Um, it's always a conflict point, no matter how long you've been doing it. And so that you don't want to have a conflict point right before a child's going to close their eyes and try for sleep because that conflict rises um, the arousal state of the child and makes it harder for them to fall asleep. I'd rather see a world where parents remove the devices an hour before. And also, we don't want children looking at these uh, lit screens within the hour before bedtime because that blue light tells the brain to stop producing melatonin. Um, of course, melatonin is our sleep hormone. So uh, particularly in our teenagers who are already struggling with a delayed sleep phase, we don't want to expose them to light that's going to make them more awake. And then um, we also know from uh, the research that the, there is a relationship between number of hours of screen use and number of hours of sleep. So it's a significant big, it's a, it's a huge factor. And it's one that I, um, I, have not, I haven't yet seen. I've maybe seen like, I think that there was one family in the past, let's call it five years, that actually was effective at completely removing screens from the bedroom and uh, the hands of their child the hour before bedtime, but it's very hard to pull off. So, well, what that what are the the kids supposed to do during that hour? During that hour before bedtime, where um, devices are removed, we want uh, kids to have a relaxing pre-sleep ritual. So, the one I always recommend is hot bath, soft music, light reading. It's good for kids to spend the hour by themselves if they can. Um, if they're not old enough to read on their own, it's fine to read with the child during that hour. But the key is, is we want those activities to be effective at lowering the somatic arousal level. So um, that is the key. We want that sort of whole physiological state to be in, um, a, we want the somatic arousal level to be lowered and to be on them in its nice calm state so that they're uh, primed for sleep entry. And um, Dr. this is one of my favorite graphs from Dr. Gazal that shows the sleep need for children based on age. And 
What I love about this chart is that, you know, it also shows what may be appropriate. So it shows the recommended number of hours, but also what may be appropriate. Because if a child isn't per se symptomatic, like let's say you're working, you know, with a 10 year old and they're getting eight hours of sleep instead of nine hours of sleep, but they're not symptomatic. If you have like, I call them the helicopter parents, and they might come into clinic saying, oh no, my 10 year old's only getting eight hours, they should be getting nine hours. And now we can say, you know, that's okay. It might be appropriate for this 10 year old to get seven to eight hours. And before we had this chart, we weren't able to have those discussions in an eloquent way because we, you know, I think like our, like I call them the helicopter parents, they, they just would get stuck in what was previously published and was previously out there, which was saying a 10 year old must get this 10 hours of sleep. And, and um, so it really opened that doorway. And we want to encourage parents to make sure that they are, you know, getting at least within the range of adequate sleep duration and keeping a consistent bedtime and wake time on weeknights and weeknights weekends, it can, it's become, you know, more challenging to um, accomplish that consistency with the pandemic. And we're finding that, you know, with this lack of structure of leaving the home for school um, and just, just lack of structure overall with the pandemic, I think, you know, time management is taking a hit and sleep schedule consistency is taking a hit. And so it, it's really important to have these discussions with families and to think carefully about uh, the consistent sleep schedule. There is now data, previously there wasn't much data on using CBT for kids, but now there is more and more that we still need more published papers in this space, but um, there have been um, there have been a nice handful of studies that do show that CBT, uh, so cognitive behavioral treatment for insomnia, is effective for children as well. Um, it is um, the gold standard treatment, go-to treatment for, um, for adults, and it's the bread and butter of all of my adult insomnia cl clinics. The interesting thing is when dealing with behavioral insomnia of childhood or pediatric insomnia, we are having, we're not just seeing, walking into a clinic room and automatically doing CBTI. It's more kind of a combination of behavioral approaches. There are some presentations, like I was talking about the psychophysiological insomnia previously. If you see a case where it's psychophysiological insomnia, nine times out of 10, you're going to go through the CBTI steps. Um, if you see a you know five-year-old who's refusing to go to bed you're not necessarily going to do cbti so um but it, it is good to know that you know the components of cbti are evidence-based and that you know we are seeing improvements with um how fast children are falling asleep and how long they're awake during the night and the percentage of time they're sleeping relative to time in bed and it's interesting that the data doesn't necessarily support an increase in total sleep time from CBTI, but that's actually pretty consistent with what we see in the adult literature as well. Um, when it comes to psychophysiological insomnia, that learned or conditioned insomnia, a lot of times patients come in wanting more sleep. We don't always give them more sleep. A lot, a lot of times treatment ends up improving their insomnia symptoms, but not necessarily increasing sleep duration. So um, the components of CBTI, um, so stimulus control is based on concepts of classical conditioning, where we um, try to teach kids to stay out of their bed outside of their sleep window and encourage them to not spend long time in bed frust feeling frustrated, stressed with mind racing. Instead, we have them get out of bed and read for five minutes if that's occurring. Sleep restriction, um, is um, a method that we use in a modified fashion for kids. Um, we use a um, we use a more faded bedtime approach where we encourage a later bedtime and then slowly back up the bedtime. With kids, cognitive therapy depends on their age group, but we will sometimes use um, some methods specific for kids to try to change the way they're thinking about sleep. And we definitely use relaxation strategies. So um, deep breathing, uh, progressive muscle relaxation, and positive imagery. And then parent training is also a very big part of what we do to help with management of our pediatric insomnia cases. So, um, and it's funny because a lot of times in clinic, our families come in and the parents are saying, okay, my kid's not sleeping, help me fix them. And unfortunately, you know, the reality is, is 
it's not just as easy as that. A lot of times I do need to get the parents on board and the parents have to make changes as well. And so we have to, like, I usually just spend the first visit just trying to get rapport with the parents and help them to see insight into the, the need to change some of their habits. Um, and, you know, we want them to have the right communication style with their kiddos. Um, we don't want them to be, um, you know, not overly passive, not just letting kids do what they, whatever they want to do, not overly aggressive and, you know, asserting too much authority, but kind of more assertive, that in-between space where, you know, they're able to communicate in a way that's, you know, showing respect for who they are as parents and respecting the child as well, but kind of enforce, but still enforcing the structure. Positive reinforcement, so you can see like a bedtime chart is something we'll use in that space where we're teaching um, kids to change behavior, we're giving kids skin in the game. We're saying if you change these behaviors, there's something in it for you too. <laughs> you can earn points, you can earn rewards, that helps spirit, That helps in a big way as well. Um, bedtime pass is another approach that we use um, where kids are given a pass at the start of the night. And if they don't leave the bedroom and they hold on to their pass, they can exchange it for something special in the morning. And then enforcing structure and discipline is another important component of parent training that we have to, and this one I've talked about, especially lately with the pandemic, that we can't just kind of like let it be a free for all. Um, we still need structure in the home. And so another really important space when we're talking and working with parents is helping them to understand what to do and what not to do during the night. And this concept of removing parent involvement from sleep has been along uh, since 1907. So since Emmett Holt wrote the book of the, called the, the Care and Feeding of Children. And um, I highlighted some of the interesting concepts that have been around since 1907. So um, when asked the question, how should a baby be put to sleep? He says, the room should be dark and quiet. The child's hunger is satisfied and the child be generally comfortable and laid in crib while awake. Is rocking necessary? He says, by no means. It is a habit easily acquired, but hard to break and a very useless and sometimes injurious one. The same may be said of sucking a rubber nipple pacifier or and other devices for putting a child to sleep. So no rocking, puts the child in bed a week. Um, and then he says, disturbed sleep or sleeplessness may be, may be due to causes purely nervous. Such, uh, such are bad habits acquired by faulty training as when the nursery is lighted and the child taken from its crib whenever it wakes or cries or when some of the contrivances for inducing sleep have been used, any excitement or romping play before bedtime, fears aroused by the pictures and stories are frequent causes. So basically, Emmett Holt in 1907 really um, laid a lot of the early, early, early groundwork for what we want parents to do and not do. Um, and you know, to the, at this point in time, what we're teaching parents with um, who are dealing with behavioral insomnia of childhood is those very same concepts. So we want, um, you know, they either are taking this approach to standard extinction or graduated extinction. And the main point is we want them, to, we want to remove parent involvement from sleep. So we either encourage them to do it in a speedy way, standard extinction, which takes about seven to 10 nights, um, or graduated extinction, which takes more like three to four weeks. Um, and I can talk about the differences for why we select one over the other. So standard extinction means that you're putting the child down awake but drowsy and you're not returning until morning. This is true for babies, also can be done with toddlers um, and even older kids if the parents are too involved with sleep. So the challenge of standard extinction is that the crying gets worse, louder, and more intense than parents have ever seen it. And those first few nights are brutal and it's really hard for the parents to keep up with it. So um, the, um, we, and then we call that the extinction burst, meaning it gets worse before it gets better. Then we are seeing the, um, we, we see a lot of guilt and distress when that happens. The parents feel really guilty when they're hearing that more intense crying um, and then as a result go in the room, which actually just makes matters worse because then the child learns if I cry louder, I get my parents to come in. 
But because it's a really hard approach to use and there's a lot of guilt response and we see the extinction first, there, um, the concept of graduated extinction was developed, which is a more sort of over time slow approach to removing parent involvement from sleep, where parents will slowly move further and further away from the bed or crib over time. So every three nights, just kind of like moving themselves further away. The first three nights, if they're, if it's a toddler bed, they'll lay in bed with the child in the toddler bed for the first three nights, then sit upright, then in a chair next to the bed, further and further and further away. Um, and then they also use this, this concept of scheduled checks where um, every three nights, they just pop their head in at increasing time intervals. So basically they put their child down for bed and then they say, I'll be back to check on you soon. And then the first, you know, three nights, they're checking every five minutes. The next three nights, they're checking every 10 minutes. The next three nights, every 15 minutes. And slowly, parent is removed from sleep. So, um, and, and by the way, I think I have, uh, yeah. So by the way, both um, approaches are, are, are effective. So there's not a significant difference in terms of how effective graduated versus standard extinction are in terms of effects on um, how long it's taking a child to fall asleep or how long they're awake during the night. But what we do see a difference is in how uh, adherent the parents are to the intervention. So they're more adherent when it comes to graduated extinction and they express less distress. So um, that's good to know, right? Um, in terms of medication management for behavioral insomnia of childhood, there is no FDA approved medication for treatment of insomnia in children. That's not to say they're not used. So many providers are prescribing um, medications for sleep based on clinical experience, data on adults or small case series on pediatrics. Melatonin is used um, quite a bit. And in my clinics, we're seeing it more in our kids who have ADHD, autism, or developmental delay. If a child's otherwise normal, we typically are staying away from melatonin. Um, the other point in time where we might use melatonin is when um, with delayed sleep phase. So if um, in our teenagers with delayed sleep phase, we'll use it at really small doses, three to four hours before bed. So I'm looking at time. I think we have until, I have until 10, 15, right? Okay. So, um, I want to make sure I have time for questions too. And I just wanted to make the point here back to COVID and the pandemic that um, there, um, I have an article like on the, on the East Chicago website, if you want to check it out, this gives a little bit more elaboration if anyone um, wants to just see more specific tips related to um, tips for sleep in the pandemic. But I would say it's really important to make sure that parents are tending to mood symptoms. Mood symptoms are spiking not just in adults, but in kids as well. Setting very clear boundaries on electronics, um, taking a structure during the day very seriously, planning out a schedule hour by hour. Um, this is what time we're waking up. We're having lunch at this time. We're having dinner at this time. You're playing then, you're socializing then, and you're doing homework then. Um, and bedtime, wake time, we're at these hours. So I would also, I think it's also really important to make sure to have reassuring conversations and talking through problems during the day. There's a lot more anxiety and a lot more worry on the minds of children as well. They're confused and they're going through a lot right now. This is really hard on kids. And so we want parents to take the time during the day to have talks about worry, um, what's bothering them so that those are out of, so we get those worry thoughts out of their head and um, before they get into bed at night, because there has there was a study recently and that that showed that depression, anxiety, stress, um, and screen time mediated the relationship between insomnia and quality of life. So um, I also have an app called Doctor Lullaby that um, is available, like it's on the iOS store. So um, for kids that are struggling or parents that are struggling, it's just a way to access those behavioral strategies that I talked about today um, from you know from home. So parents can use that. And we have a we've done, done a really tiny pilot study that that shows that there is a reduction in time, especially with time spent awake, or 69% reduction there. Um, but essentially, it's 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 what I do in clinic, but in an app, and um, it's there if you guys want it. Um, final point: There's no evidence to suggest that any one approach is more effective than another. So you have to. 
there is just this specific kind of tailored approach to fitting the case conceptualization of the insomnia in order to manage the case the best. There's less than 50 of us that are board certified and formally trained as pediatric insomnia specialists in the world. Um, yet 25 to 50% of kids struggle with sleep. So um, access to care is an ongoing problem. Um, and we want to make sure that uh, and pediatricians not assessing for sleep is is an ongoing problem. We need to increase training opportunities. Um, and so that's all I wanted to make sure I had at least five minutes at the end for questions. So thank you, Lisa, for this amazing lecture. I'm so glad that we didn't lose you and you could connect to us so we could hear your lecture. It was really amazing. Yeah. and. It really with great graphs and everything and thank you and especially it's really interesting that you have made your own application with these uh, information that you are giving it's really I think it's worth uh, using and really thank you for that so um, I just had one question actually myself I didn't get the part that you were talking about the sleep efficiency formulas that how can we uh, measure the sleep efficacy so could you explain that for me again Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and if you want even, like if you take a screenshot, this screen right here yes. actually shows the math as well. Um, and so what you do is, um, so it'll, give, it'll be easier for me to explain as an example. So let's say a child is spending 10 hours in bed. So you go, like they fill in, the parents fill in the sleep log and it shows that the child is getting, um, is, is spending 10 hours in bed. So your um, the time between they first get into bed and the time they get out of bed in the morning is 10 hours. You take that 10 hours and first multiply it by 60. So that you then you have 600 minutes. And so from that 600 minutes, then you would subtract this G letter, how long they're um, awake in the morning. So, because sometimes kids, they wake up at seven, but they're in bed till 7.30, right? So you subtract that 30 minutes then you also subtract how long they're awake in the middle of the night, right? Maybe they spent two hours awake in the middle of the night. So you subtract another two hours from there. So then you subtract how long it took them to fall asleep. So maybe it's another 30 minutes there. So then you subtracted three hours. So then you have seven hours that they're actually sleeping of those 10 hours in bed. And so seven hours, let me do this too, this is my mental math leave something to be desired. So then you have seven times 60 is 420, and that divided by 600 is 0.7. So that gives us a 70% sleep efficiency. So that means that the child is sleeping 70% of the time that they're in bed. And typically our goal is to get them to 85 or 90% for the sleep efficiency. So does that make sense? Yeah, actually, it made a lot of sense. Thank you so much for this explanation. Thank you so much. Sure. Yeah, and I then took your the print app, screen as well. Yes. Okay, good. And like, if you if you did end up checking out like the the Dr. Lullaby app, the um, when parents fill in the sleep logs in the app, it does all of the calculations there. And so you'll see like in the dashboard, that's what the sleep efficiency is. That's what the sleep onset is, mm -hmm. and you know, it gives all really? the data. It does the math wow. for you. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Okay, so I see a question in the chat section that they're asking you about, can RLS, I think they mean restless leg syndrome, cause awakening children during sleep without symptoms at the beginning of sleep? So, yeah, it's a good question. Um, and I might not be the absolute best person to answer this question in particular because I'm a behavioral specialist, but from my understanding on restless legs, mostly it's, causing more sleep onset insomnia, right? Like mostly we're seeing a delayed sleep onset. And actually like we do see like a lot of, I see a lot of kids with ADHD and a lot of them have restless legs. Um, and so we see that there's a delayed sleep onset. So sleep, so at the start of the night, now we often see that there can be a relation. So that's where the symptoms are, but we also see a relationship between RLS and PLMD. So periodic movement disorder. So while the restless leg symptoms themselves might not be what's you know, causing prolonged wake ups during the night, the, we can sometimes more so see that the periodic limb movements are disturbing sleep quality or fragmenting sleep. 
I will say I'm working with one adult who has like a very, very complex RLS with insomnia. And he tells me that he has RLS in the middle of the night. I think it's just more rare. Like he'll say that because if he's up for a long enough time, then his restless leg symptoms will start to kick in. So I, I do think it can happen. I just think it's less rare. It's more rare. Mm -hmm. And thank you. So I see another point that they're saying that attempts are being made to correct the child and adolescent sleep plan, but the child and the adolescent do not accept it and insist on their own wrong sleep plan. So what's your suggested solution in that? <laughs> oh my gosh, you're <laughs> fire here. I, it is such a tough tip. It's really hard. Adherence and buy-in are very challenging. You know, what I learned, so I did my internship at um, Hopkins Kennedy Krieger, and um, I got to work with Gina Richmond, who is like this expert in family therapy. And she taught me really early on about the importance of joining with the family. So on your very first visit, you want to make it your job to build rapport with these parents, however you can. You know, it's, it's, it's as subtle as like, you know, having the same mannerisms as them, you know, kind of cracking jokes with them, figuring out just how you can kind of get them comfortable. Um, and then if you need to, using a little bit of motivational enhancement. So motiv there's a lot of really great papers in the motivational enhancement space, and they're really important to use in that first visit while building rapport and buy-in. And oftentimes when I start seeing parents' resistance, I just tell them like, that's, you know, it's totally, you, you can continue status quo. You can continue the approach you're taking, but how's that working for you? You know, I kind of asked them that question in a nice way, but I assume it's not going so well because you wouldn't, because you're here, right? Like you, you showed up today in the clinic for a reason and I'm here for you if you want to change your ways, but you also don't have to, right? Like we have a lot of patients right now not sleeping. So I know it's not like we have a shortage of people trying to fill the slot. So you kind of also make it clear, like you don't have to do this, but I think, and I'm, I'm guessing that you want to, like you, I think it's the way you phrase it. And if you can use some motivational enhancement and let the control stay from them, like let them hold on to the control. It's their choice. It's your decision, but I'm here to help you if you want to. Yeah, really, it's all about communication, I think, so. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Okay, so uh, thank you, Lisa. I, I don't see any other questions in the th chat section, so thanks again for joining us. It was really great to listen to this amazing lecture, and hopefully we can see you in our new future webinars and in our future uh, events. Hopefully we can keep this uh, connection in the near future. Thank I would love again. that. And I promise not to mess the time up next time. <laughs> that, this that, has been wonderful. So Thank you so much for directing. Um, and it's so really much. been nice to meet you guys. Thank you so much, Lisa. Okay. So uh, next we're going to uh, Dr. Bad, Dr. Shabin Reza Bad, a pediatric neurologist from Children Medical Center, Tehran University. Dr. Bad, if you can hear me, we are ready for you whenever you are. Yes. Can you hear my, hear my voice? Yes, yes, perfect. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bakhtiari, for coordinating this session, and a special thanks to Professor Ashrafi and uh, Dr. Medali for their great uh, presentations. My uh, today's talk is about differentiation between uh, frontal lobe epilepsy and parasomnia in children. Yes. Okay, so I will be I will play the pre-recorded lecture for you now. So uh, just before so starting much. this, uh, just for our uh, audiences, before starting this lecture, I'm seeing in the participants part, I'm seeing a lot of galaxies. So please <laughs> make sure to rename your IDs to your actual name if you uh, so we can give you the participation uh, certificate. Please rename your IDs. Okay, so with that, I'm going to start your lecture. Thank you so much. In Thank you very much. Okay. and uh, good evening to all participants. Thank you so much for having me. First of all, I should appreciate to all efforts which makes this webinar possible and a special thanks to Professor Gozel and his brilliant and elegant team. My talk is about differentiation between frontal lobe epilepsies and uh, parasomnia in children. And as you know, epilepsy affects about one in every 26 people around the world. And 
it uh, is equal to 65 to 80 million people around the globe and uh, so epilepsy is the most common neurologic disorder in children and uh, let me uh, define uh, the epilepsy the epilepsy um, is defined as at least two unprovoked seizures occurring more than 24 hours apart or one unprovoked seizure and a probability of further seizures similar to the general recurrence rates uh, of at least um, 60 percent by uh, presence of obvious interictal uh, eg abnormalities and um, epileptiform discharges and the third definition is diagnosis of epilepsy syndrome uh, for example childhood abstinence epilepsy that uh, in that time we can define it as an epilepsy syndrome epilepsy is uh, the disease associated with spontaneous recurrent events and in this definition seizure is uh, the mentioned events and seizure may have motor or non-motor manifestations and also it may be brief or prolonged as well in this slide you can see the wide uh, a spectrum of motor and non-motor manifestations of epilepsy and this is only the behavioral manifestation of epilepsy and you can see uh, the variety of sign and symptoms seizures may occur during a sleep and nocturnal seizures happen when the child is sleeping uh, they are most common right after falling asleep just before waking up or soon after waking up. On the other hand, sleep disorders are common in patients with epilepsy and epilepsy and sleep have a complex and bi-directional relationship. And as you kind of know, nocturnal seizures and anti-epileptic drugs can cause sleep fragmentation, sleep disorders, altered sleep structure, and even decrease in sleep uh, efficiency some epilepsy syndromes occur mainly during a sleep uh, they uh, include frontal lobe epilepsies mainly benign childhood epilepsy with centrotemporal spikes or uh, rolandic epilepsy panoitopoulos syndrome this is a kind of uh, occipital or benign occipital epilepsies in children and um, atypical rolandic epilepsies in children that uh, is related to some sort of um, ESES or electrical status during a sleep and cognitive impairment and also ESES spectrum from London Kleffner syndrome to continuous spike and wave during a sleep. In this picture you can see the infrequent epilepsy home discharges mainly at uh, right temporal area and this is the EEG of the same patients during the sleep and you can obviously see the focal electrical status epilepticus during sleep without any motor manifestation. So, so we are facing with wide uh, range of um, epilepsy syndromes in childhood with some sharing areas. These include childhood epilepsy with occipital proxies or uh, panoitopoulos syndrome early onset childhood epilepsy with occipital paroxysms, benign focal epilepsies with uh, affected symptoms, atypical Rolandic epilepsy, atypical benign focal epilepsies, and uh, range of CSWS or continuous spike and wave during sleep, as well as Landau-Kleffner syndrome. This is a typical uh, EEG pattern of a patient with Landau-Kleffner syndrome and uh, recent regression in verbal skills as auditory agnosia as well as hyperactivity let me have a look to frontal lobe uh, epilepsies the clinical and electrographic manifestations of FLE are extremely heterogeneous and frontal lobe epilepsies are brief and uh, they last less than five minutes uh, usually and also stereotypic manifestations uh, clustering and sleep onsets are uh, common 
and uh, prolonged seizures episodes and auras are unusual. So we are facing um, a brief seizures that manifest um, usually during a sleep. And please have a quick look to motor manifestations of frontal lobe epilepsies. Uh, they include hypermotor proximal tonic bizarre looking bicycling movements of extremities, pelvis thrusting and other sexual autoventism, vocalization, contralateral head and eye deviations, and fear and anxiety uh, with no epigastric sensation and only scaring manifestation. Please have a look to temporal and frontal lobe seizure differential semiological manifestations and features. As you see, uh, sleep activation is characteristic of uh, frontal lobe epilepsies, and this is less common in temporal lobe epilepsy. And as uh, you kindly see, the brief manifestations of hypermotor pedaling, automatism, and vocalization uh, is more common in frontal lobe epilepsies. What etiologies? Uh, should we consider in frontal lobe epilepsies? These include focal cortical dysplasia, lesional frontal lobe epilepsy, and autosomal dominant nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy with normal MRI, as you can see in the picture below. Many complex nocturnal behaviors happen during nocturnal seizures and parasomnia. These are differential diagnoses of complex nocturnal behaviors, such as sleep-related epilepsy, disorders of arousal from non-REM sleep, REM sleep behavior disorders, other parasomnia such as sleep-related dissociative disorder or sleep-related groaning, sleep-related movement disorders, psychogenic seizures, nocturnal panic attacks, sleep-related breath disorders, and uh, nocturnal wandering associated with dementia, uh, and other forms of cognitive impairment. Let me more focus on sleep-related epilepsies. These include benign focal epilepsy of childhood with central temporal spikes or Rolandic epilepsy, early onset benign childhood epilepsy with uh, occipital paroxysm or panitopodu syndrome, nocturnal frontal epilepsy, and autosomal dominant nocturnal lobe uh, nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy. This is the main part of our, my discussion. Lenos Gastaut syndrome, Lande Kleffner syndrome, and uh, epilepsy with continuous spike and wave during sleep. And as I mentioned before, uh, Lande Kleffner syndrome and epilepsy with uh, continuous spike and wave during sleep um, have main cognitive manifestations such as cognitive impairment or um, learning disorders and so on. Now I want to more focus on autosomal dominant nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy in children. Autosomal dominant nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy. Uh, this syndrome has different names such as sleep-related hypermotor epilepsy or SHE. Seizures in this syndrome occur during sleep. Leg movements, starter behavior, screaming may happen. Seizures begin between 1 to 60 years of age, and over 85% of people are diagnosed before 20 years old. Seizures in people with SHE are characterized by frequent, brief hypermotor seizures in sleep, and the person may average 8 to more than twice about. 15 to 16 seizures in one night. KCNT1 mutation is responsible for many cases of autosomal dominant nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy in children. And interestingly, KCNT1 has uh, other manifestations such as uh, migratory focal seizure of infancy with different mutation. So KCNT1 is a gene uh, responsible for many cases of uh, autosomal dominant nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy. Diagnosis of this syndrome is not always simple. In many cases, a prolonged EEG recording or video EEG monitoring is required to record the events during sleep. 
the routine EEG in children and adults with this epilepsy syndrome may be normal or show uh, rare sharp waves on the frontal area and genetic tests may be recommended to look for uh, the gene KCNT1. This is a, a, a this is this is a interesting uh, diagnostic criteria for she or sleep related hypermotor epilepsies uh, that contains the clinical manifestation or clinical uh, features of this seizure for example um, this kinds of seizure um, longs less than two minutes and the hypermotor patterns and uh, predominantly happening during a sleep and uh, also this uh, criteria include um, witness uh, data if possible or if uh, available video documents uh, as a clinical documents and video EEG documents for confirmation of the diagnosis. She diagnosis is primarily based on the clinical history. The absence of clear interictal and ictal EEG correlates does not exclude the diagnosis and it's very very important and three different levels of diagnosis certainly have been identified first witnessed when a person or a third person watching the event and the data um, gathered based on the observation by a witness and second a video documented clinical data uh, or uh, using a um, home video or a smartphone data that is now available for everyone and the third is video EG documented um, data and this is uh, the very very um, good and reliable uh, tool which requires the video polygraphic recording of at least one but preferably two stereotype events with documented ictal discharges or interictal epidemiform abnormalities in this study uh, you can see the uh, time variations of the seizures or the seizure patterns in nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy. When uh, seizures last less than 30 uh, seconds, the diagnosis become more challenging and non-motor manifestations uh, become more prominent than motor manifestations. So it is important to differentiate non-REM and REM parasomnias with uh, she or sleep related uh, hypermotor epilepsies and uh, in these categories in the category of REM parasomnias RBD is uh, REM sleep behavior disorders and in uh, she you can see this may happen in any age any time during the sleep several per night and the brief du duration it lasts only about a couple of seconds and a stereotype motor pattern and this is very very important to conclude the differential diagnosis of complex nocturnal behaviors include nocturnal seizures non-REM arousal disorders REM sleep behavior disorders and other parasomnias such as sleep related dissociative disorders in this study the authors compare the features of parasomnia with nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy and as you can see several parameters such as age of onset family history uh, episodic episode frequency per month and episode frequency per night clinical course disease duration and the episode duration movement semiology and triggering factors as well as ictal and interictal eegs uh, are investigated and uh, there are some interesting points for example um, frequency of episodes in parasomnias is usually uh, less than nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsies per night and uh, the other point is very very important which indicates that the uh, EEG and ictal EEG may be normal in 
percent of patients during the attack. So the semiological similarities together with non-specific surface electroencephalographic findings make it difficult to distinguish nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy from parasomnios and uh, the differential diagnosis of uh, nocturnal frontal lobe, lobe epilepsy is considered challenging mainly with respect to arousal parasomnias such as sleep walking, sleep terror and confusion or arousal disorders. Nocturnal video polysomnography remains the gold standard tool to achieve a definite diagnosis but is uh, an expensive procedure and not universally available. And as a simple and available tool, the frontal lobe epilepsy and parasomnia scale flip was proposed as an available tool for distinguishing NFLE from parasomnia. Flip parameters uh, include age at onset, duration, clustering, timing, symptoms, uh, stereotypic patterns, recall and vocalizations and as you can see the scores are in each domain are usually between minus two to uh, plus two and as you can see when a greater scores are achieved the possibility of nocturnal forms of lobe epilepsy become more prominent in another italian study you can see that flip scoring is more specific for nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy and arousal prosomnios but less specific for REM sleep behavior disorders so in conclusion the flip scale shows high positive and negative predictive values in diagnosis nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy versus arousal prosomnios and rbd however the scale is associated with the real risk of misdiagnosis in some patients and gives uncertain indications in about one third of cases mainly rbd and uh, please remember that the flip um, tool is simple available and a cheap procedure and on the other hand there are many distinctive polysomnographic traits in nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsies and the significant polysomnography alternations seem to emerge in patients with NFLE, such as increased REM latency, epileptic fragmentations of slow wave discharges, and uh, increase in cap rate. As many different multicentric studies show, ictal EEG may help in maximum half of the patients with uh, nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy. And uh, please uh, let me end my presentation with uh, three take home messages. One, differentiation between nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsies and parasomnia is not always simple. Second, uh, smart use of the available data and uh, tools such as history, home videos, EEG, video EEG, and video polysomnography are helpful in differentiation. And the third and the last but not least is teamwork plays a crucial role. Thank you so much and uh, thanks a lot for your attention. Good morning, good afternoon. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Bass, for this amazing lecture, for this. Uh, we pleasure. really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank so, you very much. Let me see if we have any questions in the chat section. Uh, I'm just saying thanks. I'm just saying appreciation notes. So, so I don't see, oh, so I see a question. So given that many seizures occur at night and require polysomnography and night recording to hunt for them, do you cooperate with sleep centers in your daily practice? Honestly, uh, we need more and more cooperation and uh, between the seizures uh, units of seizure uh, epilepsy centers, uh, epilepsy centers, excuse me, and uh, sleep um, related centers in children. And I think the, the main aim of this 
conference is starting this uh, collaboration. But now, yes, we have some collaboration between uh, our epilepsy unit and some um, sleep disorders centers, for example, the centers, uh, the centers which Professor Modaresi um, running it. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bath, for your explanation. So, My pleasure, yeah. uh, Dr. Ashrafi has given me a, a, let's just share it for now, a clip to watch. A clip about Breathe, Jason. Try to breathe, huh? What? Try to breathe. I am. Okay. Breathe, Jason. Try to breathe, huh? What? Try to breathe. I am. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ashtaki, for the clip. I felt sorry for the poor dog. <laughs> okay. But um, thanks. Okay, so before uh, continuing our webinar, so I'm going to ask everyone, let's just uh, take a memorial photo with everyone. So if anyone can open her, his or her video to have the, so that we can take a print screen of all of us uh, joining this lecture. So. Okay. We're going to give it a minute so that anyone can so I'm just going to repeat. So if you can open your video so we could take a, a memorial photo, it will be great. I'm seeing great images. Okay, so hello, everyone. <laughs> it feels great to see people. <laughs> okay, so we're just going to give it a minute. And after that, we will continue. So hopefully more people can join us with, her, with, their, with their videos. Okay, so I'm just going to repeat myself again. So if anyone can open their videos so we could take a group photo with each other, it will be great. We will continue our lecture in about 30 seconds. We will take the photo again at the end of the webinar, but we're just going to make sure that we won't lose anyone. So let's take one here right now. Oh, it says that the host needs to enable the videos. So, um. 
excuse me, should I mention that uh, there is no uh, host permission for uh, starting the video, but for microphone, yes, there is. Thanks for the explanation. So I'm going to ask everyone to say COVID <laughs> so we could smile everyone and let's take a great picture and we will continue with Professor Guzat. Okay, so I'm going to count down. Okay, so five, four, <laughs> three, two, one, and everyone smile. <laughs> Okay, we're good to go now. <laughs> we will repeat it at the at the end. Okay, <laughs> thanks everyone. So, our last but not the least speaker is going to be Dr. Gozal. Professor Gozal is an international expert in the field of sleep medicine. He is known as a pioneer in the study of child sleep, uh, childhood sleep problems, and the relationship between sleep disorders and the neurobehavioral, cardiovascular, and metabolic diseases. He has published more than 600 papers, reviewed, um, um, uh, reviewed a lot of articles uh, for more than, he has done more than 150 book chapters and reviews uh, and edited three books and has extensively lectured at scientific meetings and uh, around the world. So we are more than honored to have you, Dr. Gozal, with us. We, uh, we, we heard your amazing lecture yesterday as well, and we can't wait to listen to your um, today's lecture. So Dr. Gozal, if you can hear me, we are ready whenever you are. Dr. Gozal? Okay, so uh, I have to make Dr. Gozal co-host first so that he can start. Dr. Gozal, can you hear me? Yes, okay, so I've made you a co-host now. So if you could just open your video and also unmute your microphone. Hello, everybody. Oh, hi, Dr. Gozal. I was, it's really uh, great to meet you again. Good to see you, everybody. Uh, uh, the video showed, showed before as uh, uh, not allowed by the host. So uh, oh. that's why we couldn't access to take pictures or whatever. So oh. uh, I just wanted you to be aware of that. Um, OK, so I'm going to try to make that correct. And we will repeat that after we're uh, finished with your lecture. Sorry for the inconvenience. No, 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 no problem for me. It's just uh, yeah, I know. That people were trying to uh, yes. activate the, the video. So uh, hello, everybody, again, and thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, I am supposed to give you a lecture today uh, or a talk on uh, uh, sleepiness. So I am assuming that all of you are sleepy. So if you fall asleep during my talk, this is the best way for at least catching up a little bit of sleep that you really need, okay? Uh, we are a sleep-deprived society, and the most uh, uh, frequent cause of sleepiness is lack of sleep. This is why uh, we use, all of us use drugs, um, whether it's coffee or chai, uh, it's still the same. Uh, that's what we do. We are heavy consumers of stimulants. Um, in the form of our diet. Uh, we don't think about it, but uh, when uh, visiting uh, many friends in Iran uh, for several times, uh, it is amazing how many times you drink chai. So, <laughs> uh, and it's all over the world. You know, the success of all the coffee shops and of all the chai shops and all the <laughs> anything else that has Coke and Diet Coke and anything else illustrates the fact that we are a very sleepy society. So I wanted to point this out because obviously um, we are going to talk about children and we are going to talk about excessive daytime sleepiness. Uh, but I wanted to point out that um, defining sleepiness and awareness of sleepiness is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, none of us in our uh, ability, we, our ability as humans to perceive sleepiness is very, very poor. And you will hear many people that say, well, I'm not sleepy, when in fact, uh, they have no idea how sleepy they are. So I wanted to point that out uh, because I think that it's uh, uh, 
uh, illustrates uh, some of the difficulties that relate to being a clinician as a pediatrician, uh, seeing children and have and be able to gauge sleepiness when now we have not necessarily the child as a reporter, no child is ever sleepy. Uh, they're only sleepy when they have to do something else that they don't want to do. But if they can do something that they want to do, they will never be sleepy. You know that in the evenings uh, when it's time to go to sleep uh, and there's a nice TV show or they're playing on their computers or their uh, iPads or whatever it is, they will always say, but I'm not sleepy. And that's typical of a child. So I want to give you maybe, a, a, you know, a old case, but one that I think illustrates a lot of things uh, that we see all the time. And so we call the case, uh, this case number one, leave me alone. Um, so this is a 14 year old a white, uh, white American male um, who really presented with a history of excessive daytime sleepiness. He had difficulty initiating sleep. Uh, so um, when he went to sleep, it stayed awake for a long time. And uh, this was very bothersome to him. But then in the morning when he had to rise to wake up for uh, to go to school or uh, just wake up to do something with his family, um, it, it, it was very difficult. And he was uh, always very uh, aggressive, uh, bellicose, uh, what we call a truant. Uh, he would not follow orders. He would not follow uh, uh, requests. Uh, uh, difficult to manage, very difficult personality. Um, he never had sleep attacks. He never, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the significance of sleep attacks, but uh, uh, he had, uh, but he could be many times was reported by teachers uh, on occasion to either his attention being elsewhere, what they called to be in the moon, uh, or um, sometimes simply fall asleep in class. Uh, there was no history of weakness in the limb, so loss of posture with strong emotions. No feeling of paralysis during sleep onset or sleep offset. We will talk about all these later. And certainly no hallucinations at either a bedtime or when awakening. Uh, what about the night? Well, uh, he really, uh, you know, he would go to bed and lay in bed um, for three to four hours. But once he falls asleep, there was no snoring, no restless legs, uh, no, no legs that would be excessively moving, uh, no jerks. Um, uh, quite sleepy, very quiet sleeping, no nighttime sweating, no dry mouth, no bedtime wet, uh, need to go to, uh, to go to bed, to bathroom during the night, no um, any type of parasomnias. As, as you know, parasomnias are uh, frequent events that disrupt sleep or interrupt sleep, such as sleep talking, sleep walking, uh, things of that nature, nightmares, night terrors, none of that uh, was, uh, was present in this child. He slept in his own bedroom, in a very comfortable bed that he had chosen himself. And uh, at, from the environment where he lives, uh, there's a rail railway, a train that runs sometimes past, but uh, not that it bothered him. Uh, some street noise occasionally, and uh, uh, he could be, because he was so awake uh, before he fell asleep, he could see that sometimes through the, uh, through the window, there would be headlights of cars that are passing around. Uh, other problems that, uh, and I mentioned them as problems because they are real problems. And uh, I want to uh, serve here as a, uh, for the benefit of what we call sleep hygiene. Uh, there was a TV uh, set in the room, in his bedroom, and there were computer and games in the bedroom. The things that uh, a bedroom is a bedroom. That's why we called it bedroom. It's not a game room. It's not a TV room. It is a bedroom. So there should be a bed and nothing else, no screens, no nothing else. So uh, these were clearly a no-no for, for anybody involved in sleep or in sleep hygiene. He, uh, as, he's a teenager, that says it all, I think. Uh, being a teenager is not a, uh, is not a normal condition. That's why we have adolescent medicine, because if adolescence was not a disease, that we would not need a, a specialized uh, persons in this. Uh, this is obviously a joke, but... Uh, uh, you know, teenagers go through very significant changes and we need to be attentive to that. Um, when the parents go to bed and they notice that the light in the bedroom is still on, mom um, really doesn't really know whether the child snores or not because she doesn't go and check on the, on the, on the boy uh, when he is already in his bedroom. 
Uh, he has always been a night owl, which means that he wants to sleep always late. And um, he thinks that she thinks that the symptoms may be a little bit cyclical, maybe, you know, over a period of several weeks, four to six weeks, he seems to go into good periods and then bad periods of sleep. Um, he tells us uh, with a private conversation that he watches TV in his bedroom till he falls asleep at around two or three in the morning. Uh, it does not take supposedly uh, caffeine or, or any drugs. It does not have a history of uh, hyperphagia or hypersexuality. We'll talk about it. Uh, some depressive symptoms uh, in the past. Uh, he has been put on Zoloft and Velbutrin uh, for several months, but he still feels kind of for depression or depressive symptoms, but he still feels uh, low. And his psychiatrist studied him on Provigil, uh, Modafinil, uh, for excessive daytime sleeping uh, with partial or transient uh, benefit. Uh, review of systems was unremarkable with under the depression. Uh, he had some allergies, but he stopped all the antihistaminics uh, under suspicion that they might be uh, related to his uh, excessive daytime sleepiness. Uh, and there was no worsening of allergy symptoms, and there's no history of CNS trauma or infection. Mom and dad uh, snore and report daytime tiredness, although none of this was uh, formally investigated. Uh, his 11-year-old brother had uh, mild sleep apnea, but he's, and he is currently one of our patients. And uh, while waiting in the room, mom read some education material and reports that she may have symptoms compatible with uh, restless syndrome. Um, he's quiet, smiles, uh, does not seem to be uh, depressed, at least in his uh, demeanor and empathy. Uh, his uh, BMI is normal, um, craniofacial uh, physical exams really unremarkable, maybe a little allergic uh, rhinitis. So uh, the conceptual wor workup that we are going to visit is that uh, uh, you can have either intrinsic um, uh, from the bottom, uh, so in the intrinsic or primary disorders of excessive daytime sleepiness. You can have insufficient sleep, which as I started my lecture, uh, indicated that is probably the most frequent condition associated with uh, excessive daytime sleepiness. Um, and then uh, fragmented sleep, anything else that bothers sleep. Uh, it could be that you're next to an airport and that every takeoff of a plane will wake you up and you may not remember, uh, but at the end it interrupts your sleep, fragments your sleep, or you may have sleep apnea or periodic leg movement disorder or any other type of disorder uh, that disrupts sleep. So for example, children with uh, atopic dermatitis that uh, wake up during the itching and then have to scratch themselves a lot. Or children that have asthma and have uh, difficulty with breathing during the night or coughing, since children with chronic lung diseases. All these uh, may have disrupted sleep, and then these may translate. And the list goes on and on and on. Children with, you know, uh, 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 abdominal pain or or um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease or or many other many other conditions. So uh, the, the the differential diagnosis in a child like this is, as you can see is quite, uh, quite uh, large. Uh, first, you need to think, uh, that's the most important, of three major conditions of intrinsic primary excessive daytime sleepiness. Idiopathic hypersomnia, narcolepsy, which can be an evolving process, or klein levin syndrome because of the cyclical nature that mom mentioned. And I will touch on these, on these two, the last two, uh, in the rest of my talk. Um, but there are other considerations uh, in an adolescent child, uh, whether is, is he depressed, really? And so you can have late onset of sleep, very typical, uh, but then difficulty waking up and wanting to, very difficult to get out of bed. This uh, uh, very significant inertia to wake up from uh, and get out of bed is, is something very typical of depression. You can be taking drugs, a variety of medications, not necessarily illicit drugs, but uh, these obviously have to be considered as well. Um, personality disorders and uh, inadequate sleep hygiene, very important. A circadian disorder, such as the late sleep phase syndrome as an adolescent, you could have sleep apnea, that is because the, the, the child cannot report on himself and the parents are not really watching their sleep. Uh, it could be periodic leg movement disorder, it could be environmental and could be uh, really intrinsic insomnia of, of, of adolescents. So that, as you can see, this is a complex list, one that uh, really requires a very thorough uh, assessment. And the first question to all of you is, well, 
uh, since we are sleep disorder, we are sleep physicians, let's do a sleep study, right? And the answer is no, uh, wrong. We should. Uh, he has told us a lot of things that do not justify doing a sleep study. So what do we want to do? Uh, the diagnosis of depression may be in doubt. Maybe he's not really depressed. Uh, Provigil may be confounder. Uh, really, does he really have excessive daytime sleeping? Somebody just put him on this because of, after they started two other medications for depression. Um, environmental and sleep hygiene issues could be impacting this child, and therefore we need to understand much more before we actually go and do a sleep study. We need to know much more about the environment of this child, what he does on a regular basis, day after day, weekend after weekend, so that we can learn a little bit about it. And there's no point in doing a sleep study if he doesn't sleep much of the night. If he's going to come and fall asleep at three o'clock in the morning, what are we going to learn in the sleep laboratory? Uh, we cannot do uh, tailored sleep, personalized sleep times where the child will come at three and then sleep until midday because our technicians at the sleep, at the sleep laboratory works are, are not necessary. We try to adjust a little bit, uh, but we cannot do the excessive uh, 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 deviation from our routine either. Narcolepsy is uncommon. Uh, it doesn't have all the symptoms. And Klein-Levin syndrome is even rarer. It's a very rare condition, and therefore we shouldn't really put it in the first place either. So first thing first, let's first discuss with this child, are you motivated? Are you coming to us as a sleep clinic with excessive daytime sleeping? But are you really motivated to fix it? Because if you're not, don't waste our time, don't waste yours. And we have this conversation with every adolescent that we see in our clinic. And I see that Professor Leila Karendish is here, and she uh, does a lot of this behavioral thing. I am less, more impatient. I do, uh, uh, but she is, uh, really epitomizes the patients with these, uh, with these children. And uh, the first is what we call a contract of cooperation. Both of us need to cooperate with each other. And if there's this assumption, and it's not just the parent, it's the child himself or herself. Because if that is not going to happen, then that's no waste time. It's a waste of our time and the waste of the child's time and the family time. And there's a lot of things that need to be done. And they are not trivial to do. And you've heard from Dr. Medali already today a little bit about insomnia or about other elements that relate to how to do behavioral modifications. And behavioral modifications are not easy to do. Second thing, if you have the cooperation, now we can start doing things that are good to do. Get the TV out of the room. Get the distractions out of the room. Take the computer games out of the room. Everything, the phone, everything. Okay? We need to talk about the late sleep phase disorder. What is it? What, so that he or she understands better what we're talking about, because if not, they will not understand what we ask them to do. So we need to talk and inform them. We stop medications. There's no point in treating something that you don't know is, is necessary or not necessary. So stop medications. Let's reset the base so we understand better. We start taking away the light from the rooms so that there's no noise and no light. Light is very important. If you have a lot of light inside the room, it will disrupt your sleep and your ability to fall asleep. And let's do something that will tell us much more about the real environment. I cannot go and live with this child uh, for two or three weeks in their home, but we can do some things that will tell us some information about how they do it and what they do on a night to night or day to day. So let's do a sleep diary, uh, cheap, cheap, very cheap, doesn't cost much, but a few paper, uh, paper sheets and actigraphy well, for those when it's available, of course, uh, normally for a week or at least two weeks. If possible, two weeks would be better because it gives us a more repetitive patterns that can be identified. This is just an example. There are many, many examples. I'm not advertising for any particular one. Those with light, those without light, those with uh, interface with your, uh, with, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, your uh, phone, with your iPhone or with your smartphone. But you can do, at the end of the day, what you get is several things. Um, and you can see here that this child has, uh, you see the uh, black squares tell you that there's movement, that means that you're awake. When these movements virtually disappear, that means that they're asleep. And what they tell you is that this child is going to sleep very, very late, particularly during the weekends. Uh, you can see here that during the weekends, there's also much 
later uh, times that he actually falls asleep around midnight, midnight here about 11. Uh, one day uh, much earlier, the child will probably be very sleepy. There's awakenings in the middle of the night, but also a lot of uh, background that could be uh, because of movement. So we need to think of periodic leg movement disorder, even though there are no symptoms. Let's uh, you know, think of it if you don't get the, the appropriate response. And you can see that there's also a lot of irregularity of sleep. Okay, It's not a very regular time. Is it unusual? Well, for an adolescent that is symptoms, yes, because you can see that uh, even though he, uh, on Monday, he has to wake up early, he woke up early, but then he is obviously then having problems the next day, and, uh, and then he cannot wake up, he has to wake up for school. So you can see that there's issues with each one of these uh, situations. So the actigraphic findings told us that there was a delayed sleep onset, delayed wake time. Uh, the reportedly, the sleep-wake delay worsened after the actigraphy was taken away. So the child paid attention to kind of do show us the better side of him rather than uh, what he really does. There were some nocturnal movements, maybe PLMDs. Um, should we do a sleep study? Uh, maybe we should advance first the sleep phase be before we do the nighttime sleep study. And uh, really, it's important to remember that the late sleep phase syndrome is a very frequent cause of sleepiness in adolescents. It's a circadian rhythm disorder. It's uh, essentially, we are jet lagged. We live in a completely jet lagged situation as an adolescent uh, where we move, uh, we should be living in California for us. Uh, that's what I tell them usually, you live in California, but uh, you're here in Colombia two hours ahead but you're really living in California, so uh, that's why you're having problems. But we need to adjust you to come here, right? It is very common and associated with puberty. Some children go through it and adapt very easily, others don't. We don't understand why they do adapt or don't adapt to this shift in their circadian clock, but these changes that are associated with hormones, hormonal changes and others are clearly associated with the clock change, uh, both an intrinsic clock and peripheral clocks. And this is seen with puberty. Um, many of the adolescents, when they start or during puberty, will show it. Some adapt very easily, others don't. We don't understand that. So um, initial symptoms were this difficulty awakening and naps after school. So we need to assess for sleep deprivation, sleep onset insomnia, maybe due to the emotions. So all this needed to be done. There was no set bedtime. It was irritable when we tried to when the parents were trying to enforce it, it would become uh, very aggressive, verbally aggressive with mom at bedtime. Um, when he would be wake up, he would be also irritable and aggressive and a lot of frustration, anxiety over this difficulty of initiating sleep uh, that uh, prevented him then uh, to be the, the expected the good boy that he wanted to be. So what we did was to do what we call a phase advancement. I won't have time to uh, to go through all the details of how you do it, but uh, uh, to do a lot of stimulus control and to start uh, really uh, uh, a, 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 a bedtime routine. He will go to sleep at 1.30 when we know that he can actually fall asleep so that he has a minimal time in order to fall asleep and decondition that, uh, that resistance of bedtime, bedtime difficulty that he has associated in his mind where now he has this insomnia that does not allow him to fall asleep because he is not uh, uh, habituated to his routine. And we are going to do, give him his eight hours or nine hours of sleep, let him sleep, and then slowly, we, as you notice, we shortened a little bit the sleep so that he can, we can advance then, we can then advance uh, over time. And as you see, we do an advancement, we can do it every two or three days, we can do it once a week, it depends on the families, but you start moving his bedtime up and also rise time up. So everything starts shifting from late to earlier, slowly, progressively with patience and with a lot of reinforcement, positive reinforcement. We can help with melatonin um, 60 minutes before suggested bedtime. We use bright light for countries where there's no bright light or during winter, we use bright light exposure during the morning and we do not use at all cost, no sleep promoting agents, no hypnotic. There's no need for a child to be using medication except for natural things such as melatonin 
and in a very strict way of moving at the advancement and using bright light and exercise and physical activity rather than use uh, sleep promoting agents. So this is uh, just an example of bright light. Uh, many of the lessons, it's, um, it's now quite cheap. It's blue light. Uh, you expose it in the morning after wake up. What you're trying to do is to make sure that you phase advance uh, your circadian clock. And by doing so, you help the child then fall more readily asleep during the, the night. Uh, usually 10,000 locks. You have to sit about 30 minutes. And uh, this is very useful, as I showed on the highlight. Used in AM for about 30 to 60 minutes will do wonder to many of these kids. Uh, we have a few of these lights. You can loan them to the parents or to the child if they are cooperative. Um, and then we can, uh, you know, we can uh, uh, pick them back uh, and use it for other kids that cannot afford it. So the progress was that uh, we were able to advance from 1.30 a.m. to 11.30. Uh, we were able to wake him up from 9.30 to 8. And now we can do a sleep study. A sleep study was at 10. He fell asleep at, uh, within six minutes. You can see now that he has gotten used to the routines. His sleep efficiency was very good. He had uh, some PLMIs, but very mild, uh, with a, a low arousal index, uh, some effects of the SSRI that he was on, uh, but no other significant findings. We continue to work, and um, you know he has been doing quite well. Now waking up at going to sleep at 9:30, with waking up at 6 a.m. with improvements in mood, improvements in family interactions, is regularly attending school, and uh, remember, there's you. You're always at risk. So you need to keep your routine on uh, and continue maintaining that routine. That's a very important element, or you will fall again into the vicious cycle of the late phase time and over time. And uh, obviously we're trying to win uh, the antidepressants. So let me go and, and, and provide the case too, because I think that these cases illustrate uh, better what, uh, th this is a sleepy boy, an 11 year old boy, always healthy, since the age of six years has been noted to be inattentive and impulsive. At age nine, was diagnosed as ADHD and started on methylphenidate with improved symptoms. Age 10, he had a suspected seizure in class after he got very upset with his teacher. Parents noted him to start falling asleep in the car, at the table, during lunch or dinner. Also noted, they, they noted some strange tongue and lip movements when he's emotional. And that sometimes after that, he kind of stumbles. He is not stable on his feet. At the age of 11, he had two events of so-called seizures falling on the floor and not responded for a few minutes in class. So he was re the pediatrician referred for an EEG. The EEG was normal. It showed, didn't show any seizure activity. The pediatrician referred to child psychiatry. There was no evidence of psychopathology, but he was noted to fall asleep in clinic during each visit. And the neurologist who saw him for the seizure activity referred him to us, uh, to the pediatric sleep clinic, because obviously as a very educated and knowledgeable pediatrician, pediatric neurologist, a thought of, uh, of the diabetes. Family history was negative. Physical exam was completely negative. A more detailed history in the sleep clinic revealed that parents and other friends noticing that he seems to disconnect multiple times during the day with also these tongue movements and lip movements, sometimes eye movements. He feels better after a short nap. He will feel refreshed. Uh, there's no history of brain trauma, CNS infection, and the MRI of the brain done before coming to the clinic was normal. Uh, the sleep study was normal, except that there was sleep uh, uh, onset uh, with REM. Uh, within 32 minutes, he had REM, which is a very short latency. Normally, you would expect between 90 to 120 minutes in a sleep laboratory for this age. Um, he obviously had early onset REM. We did a multiple sleep latency, which showed a mean sleep latency of six and a half minutes. Normal for this age would be at least 20 minutes. Uh, less than uh, seven or eight minutes is considered pathological. He obviously is pathological. And there were three sleep onset REMs during these nap opportunities. And an HLA study of this child showed that he was DBQ, DQB1 or 602 positive, which uh, I will uh, ex explain a little bit more. So the diagnosis of this child is type one narcolepsy. And uh, this is important uh, because what I want to now really focus the rest of my talk is through uh, this uh, very interesting and not so rare disease uh, called the uh, narcolepsy. 
So narcolepsy type one, or uh, possibly we know less about type two, even though they can interact, uh, interchange. Uh, uh, some two, some type two can become type one over time. Uh, is that there is an autoimmune process in which a variety of immune cells developed uh, through an MHC class two uh, mechanisms develop antibodies or uh, activities that will go and destroy uh, uh, through cytokines and activation of CD8 T cells or through an MHC class one, in this case, uh, activate the formation of antibodies that will destroy uh, apocretin or orexin neurons. So the neurons that are selectively destroyed in the brain are neurons that uh, have receptors or express either the orexin receptor or the orexin itself. And these neurons are obviously selectively uh, placed in different areas of the brain that have to do with the wake arousal and appetite. And that's why they were called orexins in the first place. So what we have in type one narcolepsy is a selective and progressive uh, autoimmune destruction, uh, the triggers of which we do not understand, uh, but that destroy these neurons and that these neurons by virtue of destroying will induce a reduction in the ability to maintain wakefulness and uh, dysregulation of sleep-wake systems, uh, its rhythms, and ultimately uh, the emergence of REM phenomena even during wakefulness, which are the typical cataplexy uh, phenomena. So uh, two, several important things. Uh, first of all, the classic tetrad of narcolepsy includes excessive daytime sleepiness, hypnagogic or hypnopompic hallucinations, meaning that they can start, you go to bed and as you start falling asleep or you're in bed, you have all these hallucinations, hypnagogic, or as you come out of, of, of the sleep, you will have the same hallucinations. They're sometimes very scary and children will report them as nightmares, not as uh, anything else. They don't realize, sometimes out of body experiences for older children. This sleep-related paralysis that is typical um, and in, it can happen during both sleep, this sense that you cannot get out of bed because you're paralyzed, even you're fine, or uh, the typical cataplexy, which uh, uh, I give you a little bit of signs, you know, stumbling, sometimes falling, having a sense that he's having a seizure, can be many times perceived as a seizure, these eye movements or lip and smacking of the lips or strong protrusion. Uh, all of these are typical phenomena of uh, cataplexy in children, and you need to be very attentive to make sure that you pick those up. And a very important, that is a pathognomonic, but was not alluded, but has been added now in the new classification, is the fact that, and I'll show it to you, is disrupted nighttime sleep. Very disrupted. A lot of awakenings that uh, patients do not recall. I want you also to be aware that almost two thirds of the patients are, uh, already before the age of 20. Many start already very early, but completely unpicked. And I told you the history of this boy, it's a, one of our patients, and this boy started having symptoms already of inattention and impulsivity, and already was started on a misdiagnosed as ADHD. This is a very frequent story. People and parents and physicians and teachers did not realize that the child was excessive sleepy, and when you know that with many kids are very sleepy, they hyper become hyperactive. They become impulsive. They don't pay attention. These are very important features of sleepiness in younger children. The prevalence of narcolepsy is estimated at uh, 0.1 to 0.2 uh, uh, per 100,000 in children less than five. We had our youngest baby, uh, our youngest child that we saw ever, who had six months of age and had severe cataplexy. Um, so I can tell you that this is, uh, can happen even very, very early. Uh, it was, uh, we knew it because both parents were narcoleptic, by the way. Uh, so we knew that there was a genetic component that and we were curious. One of the children that was born did not have it. The other one was manifesting already very severe cataplexy at age six months. And uh, after the age of five up to 20, the frequency is about 0.4 per 100,000. And after the age of 20, of about 0 0.7 to 0 0.8 per 100,000. So you can see that there's an escalation over age, which in my opinion reflects two things. One, that the, this is a progressive disease and that therefore we're gonna pick it up more and more as we wait over time. 
Uh, the difference between the narcolepsy type 1 and type 2 is simply the presence or absence of cataplexy. I told you what the symptoms are. There are some polymorphins in immune-related genes that I mentioned here, particularly on the TNF component, uh, uh, but also CTSH and uh, P -P P2RY11, which is a very pre-energic uh, agent that is very important. But the most important thing that all of us should do is that about 90% of children with narcolepsy type 1 will be positive for the DQB1 or 6 or 2, while this is only present in about 20 to 25% of the general population. So if it's positive, it is not pathognomonic, but if it's negative, the likelihood of having narcolepsy is very small. So uh, this is a typical um, feature of a child with narcolepsy. What you see here on the top is a lot of the awakenings, the disruption of uh, sleep. Okay, so I told you this uh, disrupted sleep that parents, pa parents and children do not know about. This child who had very, very severe uh, sleepiness, you can see that the sleep latency was 0.8 minutes, 0 0.9, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, with an average of 0.6 minutes, so a very, very severe uh, narcolepsy as far as uh, uh, EDS, and he had um, uh, REM onset in uh, all these uh, in all these nap opportunities. So clearly, a very he also had very severe the cataplexy. This child was clearly a very severe one, and one that uh, uh, we we don't see that often now, but once in a while we we do see. So, uh, what are the differentials that we need to do? Uh, I think that that's what I'm trying to bring uh, to you a little bit more of a perspective. So what I've done is create a table here that puts. Uh, five, uh, the five conditions that I think we need to, you know, and I, I exclude secondary uh, excessive daytime sleepiness because if the sleep study is pathological, then you need to treat first the disease before you, you decide on any one of these. Um, but uh, you have narcolepsy type one, narcolepsy type two, idiopathic hypersomnia, very difficult to separate from narcolepsy type two, by the way, Klein-Levin syndrome, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it in a minute, and insufficient sleep, which I think is important. And I gave you an example of how a child can come to us really falling asleep in all over the place and yet have insufficient sleep due to behavioral issues or the late phase syndrome or something else. So we need to have at least three months of complaints for all of these except for Klein-Levin, which need to be cyclical. This cyclical sleepiness needs to come and disappear. Cataplexy is present only in narcolepsy type 1. It is absent in all the other conditions. Nocturnal sleep is disrupted in both narcolepsy type 1 and type 2. It is either normal or actually prolonged sleep in idiopathic hypersomnia. These kids sleep more, and yet they're sleepy, than the others. Uh, Klein-Levin syndrome, it's not diagnostic. And in insufficient sleep, obviously, they sleep less than what you would expect. MSLT will be eight minutes or less, as I mentioned, for all the three conditions, but is not diagnostic for Klein-Levin and certainly not diagnostic for insufficient sleep because if you sleep enough, the sleepiness will disappear. Sleep onset REM is two or more for the two uh, conditions of narcolepsy in idiopathic hypersomnia. We do not see REM onset, maybe sometimes during the first nap, the first nap in the morning, but there's what we call inertia of REM uh, into this uh, particular phase. It can occur as well in insufficient sleep due to sleep pressure. And in Klein-Levin, we've seen kids with uh, occasional uh, sleep onset trend. The more important thing is the three conditions that have to do with intrinsic hypersomnia are all chronic uh, with periodic and cyclical manifestations uh, in Klein-Levin, but resolves in, uh, in, in insufficient sleep if you give them enough time to sleep. So what are the treatments? Well, you can see that there's a very long list of new medications and old medications. I will not go through all of them, but uh, they are really in four major groups, stimulants, wake-promoting medications, such as uh, you know, st stimulants, such as fetil methylphenidate. Uh, it is approved in the United States uh, for FDA approval, which is important, um, both methylphenidate and dextroamphetamines. Uh, and these are usually the ones that many pediatricians will start. And that's the problem is that they are also good for ADHD. So there could be a lot of confusion and missed diagnosis. Modafinil is still not approved uh, uh, for by FDA. And you can see there's a new drug uh, developed in France as an histamine-based uh, uh, 
uh, agonist, this can mean B receptor uh, called pitomizant. Uh, in adults, very efficient. Uh, we don't know much about it in children. Tricyclics are good in some cases to take away some of the cataplexy, and, but sodium oxybate is the only drug that has been approved, at least in the United States, uh, for the use of cataplexy. And it also reduces the sleepiness and it's approved for age seven and older. And so Reamphetol, which has just been FDA approved, but only for adults, works through a very new, different mechanism of regulation of basal forebrain uh, stimulation. So uh, what do we do? Well, um, for those that can start modafinil, my preference, and this is, uh, again, this was uh, reviewed by uh, uh, the group in France, uh, in Montpellier, uh, for particularly for adults, but I like this approach because I believe that modafinil is a more efficient drug, even for children, and we use it routinely in our clinics. Um, uh, to start with, modafinil started at a low dose. We started at 100 milligrams, uh, 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 50 milligrams in the, in the morning, and then four hours later, and try to see the response. They can be paradoxical responses that uh, create a lot of side effects. So we start a, a relatively low dose and then escalate the dose until you control the symptoms. You bring them then for a mean sleep latency, and then look at cataplexy severity. If there is mild cataplexy, you don't do much, but if it's moderate to severe and it clearly disturbs the ability of the child to function, we use either sodium axibate, this is our preference here, uh, even though it's difficult to take, or combine both sodium oxibate with venlafaxin or with clomiprabine or atomoxetine. So these are clearly uh, 